Good morning. We will call to uh, to order the conference uh, of the Board of Supervisors on the future of juvenile uh, and adult probation. Uh, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Before I call the roll, I would like to note for the record that all supervisors are participating via teleconference. As such, all votes will be handled by a roll call vote. Additionally, before we begin, any members of the public that wish to provide oral testimony during today's board conference, please review the instructions posted on the clerk of the board's webpage. <clears throat> With that, I will now call the roll. Supervisor Anderson? Here. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Here. Vice Chair Vargas? Here. Good morning. Chair Fletcher. Fletcher here. So with that, uh, today today's uh, conference is, is obviously different from most of our normal meetings. We won't be uh, taking votes uh, and, and doing things in the normal way, but it's an opportunity for us uh, as a board to, uh, to take a step back and have a dedicated and focused uh, conversation about the future of our probation department. Uh, we have a very full agenda and, and we will work incredibly hard to make sure that we stay on agenda, uh, but we're incredibly, uh, um, pleased to have nationally recognized leaders from the field, from the probation field. And we're going to hear about research. We're going to hear about best practices, uh, specific examples of success, uh, where these practices have been put into place, uh, along with updates on new federal and state policy that have recently become law or are presently working their way through our system. And obviously in the next few months, our board will have to make a critical decision uh, about who to appoint as our new chief of probation to lead us into the future. And, uh, and I want to thank uh, our two supervisors uh, who have a subcommittee who are helping working through and engage with community leaders uh, to find that leader uh, who, uh, who we have confidence and faith in um, that, that, that can enact and drive again in a positive direction, keeping our community safe, but also embracing the tremendous opportunities uh, for reform uh, and, and embracing uh, the opportunities to really have transformative change, particularly uh, in the juvenile system. Uh, we know that throughout criminal justice, there's changes that need to be pushed uh, to uh, ensure that, that we not only comply with what we have to do with, with probation, but to move to providing a network of support, uh, to move to, to helping in particular our youth. It's been said an error doesn't become a mistake unless you refuse to correct it. And, and we wanna come in and provide that help and that support uh, to these individuals. We wanna look at the new skill sets uh, and, and new training and, and new programs that we may need um, and, and really take a holistic approach at, at what we're doing. Uh, working with our Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council, working with our probation officers, working with advocates, providers, uh, folks throughout this system. Um, and as, as, uh, as, as many uh, are aware, our probation system is now separated into two divisions, one dedicated to adults, one dedicated to youth. Uh, the new name for the juvenile probation is Youth Development and Community Services. Um, and we really wanna, wanna focus and talk about all the opportunities from enhanced training and trauma-informed care, understanding adolescent brain development, restorative practices, um, and, and a, a, a fundamentally different approach for different populations. And uh, so we're excited uh, about where we are uh, and where we are going. And I appreciate everyone's time and attention. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know Supervisor Desmond uh, could not join us today uh, due to a, uh, a family um, health situation. He had planned to be in attendance, um, but, uh, but I, I appreciate his commitment. I know he's reviewed a lot of the materials and will be providing his thoughts and input um, on this as well. And, and we send the very best to him and his family uh, as they work through these times. So with that, uh, what we're going to do is have a series of presentations. Uh, we will do a presentation, uh, then we will have a chance for board members uh, to uh, ask questions of, of the presenter and, uh, and or give any comments that you may have based on what we've heard. Um, and we will get through all of our presentations, uh, including from our worker representatives. And then at the end, we will hear from public comments uh, or testimony. And then if there's any final thoughts uh, by board members, we will, uh, we will get to those uh, as well at the end. Uh, so let's kick it off here. Uh, we will begin the presentation with the review of national and state juvenile justice trends from David Muhammad, National Director of Justice Programs at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. Uh, David is a national expert on juvenile justice reform. He is the lead consultant with Georgetown University Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, Positive Youth Development Work, 
and a technical assistance provider through the Sierra Health Foundation Positive Youth Justice Initiative. Uh, David is a former chief of probation uh, at the Alameda County Probation Department. And we appreciate tremendously, uh, David, your work and your willingness to take the time to share with us today. And uh, with that, we will turn the floor to you. Thank you, thank you, Board Chair Fletcher. And just uh, uh, somebody handed you about a seven-year-old bio, but that's all right. Uh, so <laughs> I am the uh, Executive Director of the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, we're based in Oakland, but work around the country. Everything else was right. <laughs> um, uh, and so uh, first, thank you all and appreciate this uh, opportunity to share information uh, with the Board of Supervisors. I really want to commend this board. It is not um, often that we come across Board of Supervisors who want to really dig in deep uh, into the details uh, and who acknowledge that there is some need for learning around these issues. Um, I've worked with numerous counties throughout California, uh, but even in cities and counties throughout the country um, have not uh, experienced boards often uh, like this who say we want to have a deep dive and learn and engage. So really want to commend uh, this board for doing so. Uh, so I am going to go through a lot of information <laughs> relatively quick. Uh, this could easily be a three hour presentation that I'll try to make in 15 minutes. Um, and look forward to the to the discussion. Uh, so, um, and just you know, I think much of uh, uh, my experience uh, was shared. Uh, I um, ran nonprofit agencies in uh, Oakland, working with young people coming out of the state juvenile justice system, and worked a lot on policies and advocacy in uh, California. Then I spent uh, uh, almost a, a decade inside the system, The one of the deputy directors of the juvenile justice system in Washington, DC, the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services. In fact, three of your presenters today uh, have have or are at uh, DYRS, uh, and you'll, you'll hear why. Uh, and then I was the deputy commissioner of probation in New York City. Um, and was the chief probation officer in Alameda County. I've spent the last about nine years working with numerous probation departments around the country. Uh, and through the Positive Youth Justice Initiative, as was mentioned, I had the pleasure of training about 200 uh, probation officers in San Diego over the course of uh, about a week and a half. Uh, so uh, did some, uh, some work on the ground uh, with, uh, with probation uh, over a few years as they were uh, at San Diego. Juvenile probation uh, was a part of the Positive Youth Justice Initiative uh, in California. So um, have some, uh, a lot of experience in detail around probation in California, uh, and even some right there in San Diego. Uh, so a few just grounding pieces. I uh, want to talk about juvenile justice, past, present, and future. Um, and uh, one a piece, uh, this is just often I start off so we get a sense. This is just incarceration, so not probation. Um, and this is some of the most recent data um, um, not some of the most recent day. This is, I mean, to say this is an older piece. The, the, the numbers, unfortunately, have not changed that much. Um, and so uh, one of the um, pieces here to show is the juvenile portion, which is this piece here. The, the, what used to be 69,000 is down to about 45,000. So ironically, the adult side has not changed much at all. Um, despite, you know, kind of, of what we hear, there's, there's been some, some changes in California. Uh, but the, the, on the juvenile side, there's been, um, you know, this was at one point over 100,000. So there's been a steady decline nationally in the number of young people in custody. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, a bit more recent information that should still, so even though we have had this pretty significant decline, uh, this should still startle us and really embarrass us uh, as a country in terms of our rate of incarcerating young people. Um, that is not even, you know, not even near any other industrialized nation. Uh, and so uh, just to give, and this, this is even taken into account some of the recent reductions around the country. Um, and then even more startling is the stark uh, racial disparities. Um, and so in, uh, for a somewhat recent data, it's unfortunately takes a long time for the federal government to put out some of this data. Uh, but uh, uh, from what I know, this has not changed much uh, since the most recent data uh, that 
For one every for every one hundred thousand white youth in America, thirty one are detained. For every one hundred thousand black youth in America, one hundred and sixty eight are detained. So pretty massive uh, issues of, of racial disparities. Um, just a little bit of history and, and on probation. I know my colleague uh, Vincent Chiraldi will 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 uh, address this as well. So I'll say this briefly: is the history of probation as a industry, if you will really started uh, from somebody who was a shoe cobbler. He, he made shoes and fixed shoes and was uh, went into court to ask a judge not to send uh, somebody who was struggling with alcoholism to jail, that he would work with them and uh, give, uh, give them an apprenticeship. And the judge did it, uh, and, the, and it worked out. Uh, but there's an old saying that no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> so the court kept calling John Augustus back in. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how probation was, was, was born. Uh, it was born out of a volunteer uh, diversion to probation. Uh, volunteers in two ways. One, volunteer from the from the person who uh, was doing the work, uh, but also, you know, the technically volunteer from the per the defendant who could have opted to go to jail. Uh, but the first laws around probation around the country in Massachusetts, in fact, are called the John Augustus laws. Um, and so this notion of trying to keep someone out of jail and also give them gainful employment and mentorship is the uh, foundation of probation. Uh, and then around juvenile justice, uh, the four women who brought uh, juvenile justice, often uh, led by Jane Adams in uh, Cook County, Illinois, and juvenile justice was specifically born out of the desire to have something different than the adult system and to approach young people uh, in a different way and it, it understanding that they're obviously different than adults. But prior to 1899, there was only one system. There were often um, uh, different facilities, but there was only one system. And in 1899, the juvenile court was born and out of the juvenile court, the juvenile justice system was born. Unfortunately, um, very soon thereafter, the juvenile court began to mimic uh, its parent uh, in the adult court and in the adult system um, and begin to be punitive and deficit based uh, as well as ineffective. And so these next statements uh, for me, somebody who spent nearly 10 years in, as an administrator in uh, the probation system and juvenile justice systems um, are sometimes difficult to tackle. Uh, and they're not necessarily my opinion. They are uh, what the research tells us, uh, that the justice system is ineffective, uh, is harmful, and is excessively expensive. Right? It doesn't work as it is designed to do in that it is to reduce recidivism and improve public safety. There's some people who say it is doing what it's designed to do. Um, uh, it's harmful, it cre often creates more harm, and it's certainly excessively expensive, uh, where I don't think we have any argument there. Um, and so there's been numerous studies that have really tried to pinpoint the specific impact of justice involvement. Uh, this study, uh, uh, which was pretty large and looked across jurisdictions um, and really tried to um, focus and control for other factors that might create negative outcomes like income and, and, and other issues, um, controlling just for the impact of the justice system showed that young people who come into the justice system, uh, the justice system impact is large decreases in the likelihood of high school completion and large increases in the likelihood of adult incarceration. Uh, another study uh, from before showed, this is the study that I, to be honest, I remember reading it a long time ago and struggling because my work uh, that I did in the system was trying to make the system better and trying to have the system uh, do good things by young people. Uh, and this study, which used some sort of uh, randomized control trial, also saw that doing nothing uh, actually created better outcomes in young people than engagement in the system, even when there was so-called good uh, uh, engagement, positive engagement, which again, I've struggled with this, uh, but it is the, you know, the research is what it is. Um, this uh, book, which is really about the impact of, of, of drugs and some of the mythology we have around drug use, uh, also uh, had this um, uh, research around showing that when teens are given non-custodial sentences, uh, they actually do better uh, in terms of employment and education and reduce recidivism than those who are incarcerated uh, for those same uh, uh, delinquency. 
And so, um, and then excessively expensive. Nationally, uh, the Justice Policy Institute with the uh, groundbreaking report called Sticker Shock showed about $150,000 a year per youth, but California's an outlier. It's, it's much more than that. Uh, and so a more recent study by the San Francisco Chronicle, which examined uh, county data uh, of several uh, counties throughout California, uh, showed pretty, you know, this is a you know slide that's got a lot of things going on. It might be hard to follow, uh, but showed that, for instance, in, in my old county, a juvenile hall bed costs, one bed costs $493,000 per year. Uh, pretty, pretty difficult. Uh, and this same, the fact that the, the, this report that the Chronicle was doing was initially about youth violence. And so the, the study headline is called Vanishing Violence uh, because the, the, the rate of juvenile violent crime has plummeted in California, despite kind of opinion. Um, and yet the um, spending on incarceration has only increased. Um, this is a slide that is very difficult to read that I will <laughs> make sure folks have and send, uh, but it's an attempt to put the uh, process of young people in the system onto one slide. And because the, the process is detailed, it's difficult to get onto one slide. Um, my friend and colleague, James Bell says, I won't call it the juvenile justice system, I'll call it the sector, uh, because one, it's not systematic. Uh, and there's so many different players involved. Uh, and that point is, and I'll just quickly go through this, um, that at the point of arrest, obviously you have arrests, the vast majority of arrests are conducted by city police departments uh, or school police departments. Um, and at the point of arrest, police have quite a bit of discretion on what they do with a young person. Uh, obviously, one of those things they do is bring a young person to the county juvenile hall. Another thing they can do is Provide, give a notice to appear or some type of summons that they then, the police department gives that to probation. Uh, in California, uh, for children over the age of 13 um, or over the age of 12 uh, who, are, who are arrested in suspicion of a felony, the probation department must turn that uh, over to the district attorney. Uh, but that's in terms of charging. In terms of holding in detention, probation has quite a bit of discretion. Uh, so any young person who is uh, arrested for a 707B offense, which is a serious and violent offense in the Welfare and Institution Code, they must be held, uh, but that's it. And any other young person where there's a court who has ordered them to be held already, uh, but that's a small percentage of youth who are presented to juvenile halls around the state. Um, and, th and therefore probation has quite a bit of discretion to have alternatives to detention. Um, then of course the adjudication process, uh, and I'm sorry, in addition to alternatives to detention, probation has complete discretion for any young people charged for misdemeanors. Uh, probation has the full discretion to divert all of those cases out of uh, the, the system. Uh, then ult obviously ultimate decisions are made uh, by the court um, and for young people who are adjudicated, um, uh, found involved. And there's a reason why there's certain language in the juvenile court that's not found in the adult court, because legally in California, and I think every state in the country, children don't have the culpability level to commit crimes, right? Unless you're charged as an adult. And so we, we, we use words in the juvenile court like adjudication and disposition different from guilt and sentencing. Uh, and so the dispositions that you can receive in the juvenile court, informal probation, formal probation, sent to county camp, sent to an out-of-home placement uh, until June of this year, sent to the Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, and of course, then you could also be charged as an adult uh, if the court, which of course changed from direct filing from the district attorney to a decision by the court. So this is just an attempt to get the process down because I know there were some questions uh, in terms of understanding the full spectrum of the juvenile justice process. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish up with um, recommendations and some discussion about what has happened around the country. Uh, one piece is this notion of positive youth development. This has been uh, my uh, work uh, on uh, in the justice system <clears throat> is trying to ensure uh, that young people are engaged in what we refer to as positive youth development, a strength-based, asset-based youth development process. Uh, the traditional uh, system that we have struggled with for decades uh, in this country and in this state 
uh, versus a positive development paradigm. So the traditional system is deficit-based, it's punitive and sees young people as problems. Uh, we say, what is wrong with you? How can we fix you? Or what did you do wrong? How can we punish you? A positive youth development approach is building on the strengths and assets of young people. What's good and right with you? How can we build upon that? Uh, so a very different view in which how do we address uh, and how do we help and support young people? Um, and so a few pieces around how do we get to a system? I'm going to go through this uh, somewhat quick. Uh, one is uh, to uh, keep the length of supervision short. Why is that? One, we have limited resources amongst probation officers uh, and a prolonged mandated government intrusion into people's lives uh, have been proven to be to bring about uh, negative outcomes in variety of levels, but certainly in the justice system. Uh, reduce the conditions of probation that are only directed to a young person's goals of rehabilitation development. So uh, right now before the California legislature's Assembly Bill 503, it would do these two pieces. It would reduce probation a little shorter than even I have suggested in the past, but it would reduce probation terms in the community to six months. It would also say that all the terms of probation must be tied, there must be a nexus uh, around helping the young person uh, develop in rehabilitation. Uh, very important uh, pieces around building a youth development system. Uh, eliminate incarceration as a consequence for technical assistance. Young people shouldn't be locked back up for um, uh, breaking a rule that's not against the law, that is something uh, you know, like a missed appointment or a late appointment or not checking in when they're supposed to uh, come in a little late from curfew, they shouldn't face incarceration for those rule violations. And we should incentivize young people for achievement. A lot of research around the effectiveness of this, uh, of, of promoting their doing good and rewarding them for doing well. Um, a young person on probation should be able to earn time off uh, for achieving certain milestones. Uh, and these measures would all reduce the caseload and workload of probation officers whose caseloads, yes, are too high and workloads are too high. Uh, and it's a really a win-win for a PO and young person to reduce the caseload, to reduce the time they're on probation. The last thing I'll say here, which somehow didn't make this PowerPoint, <laughs> which might be more, most important, is to change the duties and responsibilities of probation officers. I actually need to, I think they should be changed their position descriptions and change their performance evaluation process so that probation officers' duties are to connect young people and their families to service supports and opportunities that they need and also build on their strengths and not just issue them a bunch of referrals, but to actually connect them to community-based services that address their needs and build on their strengths. That should be the duty uh, of a PO and they should be evaluated uh, based on that. Um, so to build a positive justice system is really about reduce, improve, and reinvest, reduce the size of the system and significantly improve uh, the system and the uh, outcomes of young people, reinvest the savings from a smaller system back into the community. Uh, and I'll just give you a few examples as I close. Wayne County, uh, in, back in 2000, 21 years ago, they took all of the young people that were in the state system in Michigan back, so Wayne County's Detroit. Uh, they brought them all home from the state system, uh, and they actually phased out the use of government-based probation officers and contracted with community-based organizations to provide services, support, as well as supervision. Um, and the system maintained the facilities, the contracts, and the quality assurance, but the direct work with young people are, is conducted by community-based organizations, as well as larger um, health-based organizations. Uh, for many years, the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative is about reducing the number of young people in juvenile detention. It has worked pretty well. We've had about a 65% reduction in juvenile detention since the launching of JDAI. Um, Missouri, which is mostly known for its state facilities, home-like, small, rehabilitative youth facilities that many of us have tried to replicate around the country. Uh, in DC, and you'll hear much more about this about from my friend and colleague, Clinton Lacey, so I won't spend too much time on it, just to say we really reduce the number of young people who are in our facilities. Uh, we developed this DC model based upon the Missouri replication. I know you all are working on something like this in San Diego. Uh, we had a whole overall approach of positive youth development. We had all our staff go through three and a half weeks of training in positive youth development, as well as a DC model. 
we created this regional service coalitions in the community uh, and credible messenger mentoring, which you should hear a lot more about later. Uh, in New York, close to home, same thing as in Wayne County, brought all the young people home from state systems and then put them in residential placements run by community-based providers. Um, and some of the some of the data on this is, is profound. And Vinny Chiraldi, who's going to talk about the adult system, but has a lot of good information about the close to home program. Here in California, we actually are could be a model around our reduction. Uh, when I started going into CYA in 1998 been doing this a while. <laughs> um, um, we, there were 10,000 young people in those facilities. Um, and uh, I was going there two to three times a week, uh, teaching workshops and, and planning for young people's uh, uh, release. We're down less to 800. Uh, and of course, SB 823 will get us uh, closure. Intake will close this year in, in the summer. Uh, SB 81 several years ago had juvenile realignment. We talk about adult realignment, AB 109, but actually prior to that was SB 81 juvenile realignment. And then we have the Juvenile Justice Crime Prevention Act dollars. There's more around California, but one of those more is in LA, which still has a lot of work to do. I know you all might be mad with LA about stealing your chief probation officer, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, LA has closed several camps. I think it's actually more than five camps now. They've added 10 community members, really act advocates to their uh, juvenile justice coordinating council that created a bunch of more money out to the community. They gave $12 million to youth diversion development department around juvenile diversion. So they took that money from their department and gave it to YDD, a newly created department in the county. $25 million over the course of the last few years have been taken out of the probation department's budget and given to two community foundations to expedite the money is given to community-based organizations, half of it for services, half of it for capacity building of those organizations. Pretty extraordinary program that they stole from us in Alameda County that we helped them do, So, <laughs> but they gave a lot more money than, than we did. And the, the Board of Supervisors recently approved a plan to over the next five years uh, uh, remove the responsibilities of juvenile justice from probation and into a newly created youth development department. Uh, San Francisco is closing its sole juvenile hall by the end of this year. Um, and then uh, this is just came out just a few weeks ago in Harris County, the third largest probation department in the country. Uh, they took a portion of the probation department's uh, budget um, and are giving it to a community, a series of community leaders and community members to determine how it should be used in the community. Uh, so a community reinvestment fund. Uh, so those are just a number of examples. Uh, even though I went uh, pretty quickly, I probably still uh, went over my time, uh, but uh, really appreciate uh, the time this morning uh, to discuss juvenile justice with you. David, I, we, I, I appreciate that. That was a, a tremendous uh, uh, presentation. I have one quick question, and then I know uh, some of my colleagues will as well. You mentioned AB 503, uh, state legislation to reduce the length of, of, of probation. And I guess my, my two questions are, what do you think that right number would be? Do you think 503 is getting it right, or is it different? And then are you aware of anything that would prohibit us as a county uh, if we figure out that's a best practice and that makes sense from just doing it, uh, because legislation can take a considerable amount of time to get through, get signed when it goes into effect and, and, and so forth. Yeah, so interesting. Uh, I've talked a lot about reducing uh, terms of uh, probation, lengths of probation for years, um, and uh, have always talked about it at 10 months. But that is taken into account time. Young people would also maybe be pre-release. Uh, the other thing about this is this legislation does contemplate uh, that on, on occasion, there might need to be an extension of an additional six months up to 12, and that can happen through this legislation. So given that, uh, I actually think this is very smart, good legislation. So it's it would reduce juvenile probation terms by six months. It would allow probation and the court to reconsider uh, whether a young person needs, they would have to on the record say why they would need a six month extension. Uh, and it says you must tailor the terms of conditions to what a young person needs. I, I think uh, it, it is, is model legislation. And to your very good point, basically this can happen now. It can happen in two ways in San Diego. It can happen how probation recommends. So 
how the how the how it works is when a young person goes to disposition, juvenile sentencing, probation department gives a social study as well as a disposition report to the court. And the court almost always goes with what probation says. Um, and so probation could change its recommendations now to both include those shorter amounts of time, but also those specifically tailored terms of probation. Uh, so really, or even if the court doesn't order it, uh, probation can do it uh, itself, meaning you you don't have to actively supervise someone after a certain amount of time. So probation has quite a bit of discretion to start this now. So we don't have to wait for the state law. We we can figure out how to do it now. Absolutely, wonderful. Thank thank you for that. Uh, let's go. Uh, I see Supervisor Anderson, uh, and uh, and then we will go through uh, through my other colleagues if they have questions or comments. Uh, I I uh, when you're looking at homes or facilities, uh, have you looked at some of the ratios? Uh, uh, do you have any hard numbers on that of what are successful ratios? Uh, many of the facilities I've toured uh, in my prior life, I spent 12 years as the vice chair of public safety in the, in the legislature here in California. And I toured many of the facilities and, and uh, so many of the folks that uh, went through the system and had great outcomes looked to the PO as their coach. And there was a lot of life coaching going on. So did you, have you looked at any of those ratios? Uh, yes, yeah, so a couple of pieces on this. Uh, first, I thought you were saying residential ratios, but you mean caseload ratios. Right. Um, so, you know, my friend and colleague, Brian Levins, who's now the, or the, no, he's the president-elect of the American Associ the Association, American Probation and Parole Association, uh, talks about the POS coach, uh, right? And so, uh, I always said I had schizophrenia in Washington, D.C. when I was hiring uh, uh, the equivalent of parole agents, actually, uh, because I both wanted the community to have much more responsibility uh, and control, but I was trying to hire the best people I knew to be EOs. Uh, and so, and that was about uh, understanding uh, that young people need to have that positive relationship. What's most impactful for young people, to actually, depart regardless of type of service, is a healthy relationship with a positive adult. That is the most transformative aspect. That's why this notion of credible messenger mentoring, uh, I used to run an organization a million years ago called the Mentoring Center. Uh, that is what is most impactful in terms of a positive relationship. And so uh, if you're going to have that in any way, you certainly can't have 40, 50, 60 people. There's caseloads up to 100 and some general supervision uh, in some it, to this day in Los Angeles. Um, and so, what we, uh, I'll just give you um, two examples. In Washington, D.C., we said we, you know, we tried to have not have caseloads more than 25. Uh, but when we wanted to have really increase the amount of engagement, that it, that was even difficult. Uh, and we increased the amount of, of documentation. Uh, in, in Oakland, we have a life coaching model. We, the city has hired uh, 13, 14 adult life coaches and 10 juvenile life coaches, a program I've, I've been able to help shape and provide training for. Now, that is not of government workers. That is of community-based organizations funded by the city of Oakland. Uh, and we say you can't have a case of more than 10 because we want you to talk or text message with your client every client every single day and see them two to three times a week. And you really can't have that level of engagement with more than about 10 people. Thank you. I think we're presently at about 25 to one. That is, that's amongst the lowest, if that's, a, that's average, right? I've heard that in special units, uh, but if that's average, that is not bad. <laughs> yeah, no, last year, last year came to our board to set that as, as the, as, as the standard. That's uh, good to hear. But, um, and then our, our special courts and a lot of those special programs are 10 to one, as you mentioned. Yep. As you mentioned, so. Um, thank you, Supervisor Anderson. Thank you, Dave. Let me ask my other colleagues if they have any uh, questions or comments they'd like to make. Well, I, this is Supervisor Ars. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna go ahead and wait until everybody else provides. I know that there's a lot of uh, alternative models um, that, are, that are working and I've seen some of the ones, particularly with community colleges that I'm really interested in. I'm having been a former trustee um, and so I'll wait, but I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your time and your dedication um, to this work. It's so critical and important for us, to, for our young people. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't see any other supervisor questions. David, we, we appreciate you tremendously. I know you're engaged regularly uh, with a lot of folks in San Diego County. I've read your work, uh, looked at a lot of the stuff you've been involved in, and, and I, I'm so incredibly grateful on behalf of the county 
uh, for you taking time to join us and for all the work you, you've done throughout your career. So thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. Um, we're now going to move. Uh, next up is uh, Clinton Lacey. Clinton is the director of the District of Columbia uh, Department of Youth Rehabilitative Services. He previously worked as a deputy commissioner with the New York City Department of Probation, project manager uh, with the W. Haywood Burns Institute and director of youth justice uh, at the Vera Institute. Uh, Clinton, we are thrilled to uh, to have you join us today and appreciate you making some time to uh, share, share some wisdom with us. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. The floor is yours, take it away. Uh, absolutely, thank you so much. And again, I'm really happy to be here, um, to have the opportunity to participate in this these critical conversations that are taking place. And certainly um, with, with my colleagues, um, uh, following David Muhammad is not something that I recommend for people to do. So it's, it's, it, he's, he's such an awesome leader in this field, but I'll try to do my best. And also I'm happy to be uh, involved in the conversation with Vinny Schiraldi, um, who obviously has been doing awesome work in, in this field and, and all others who are involved. I wanted to begin my conversation by talking about um, really um, when I joined New York City Department of Probation as the deputy commissioner. Um, David Muhammad had previously uh, been in that position working for Benny Shiraldi, who was commissioner at the time. Prior to that, most of my career had been spent working with young people at Rikers Island. Um, uh, as young as 16, at that point, New York was still, the age of 16 was the age of, of adulthood with regards to the justice system, working with young people in the jail and then coming into the community. Um, and as was mentioned, I did some work at Vera Institute, uh, but ultimately joined the W. Haywood Burns Institute where we were addressing racial and ethnic disparities uh, in the justice system um, around the country. Um, and spent several years there working to, with system leaders, of course, uh, probation, uh, court, uh, detention, um, elected officials and other stakeholders to bring uh, important reforms, to achieve important reforms with regards to how the justice system was functioning and, and treating people, all people, and obviously with the uh, disproportionate representation and disparate treatment of youth of color was something that we were focused on. Um, I did that for, for about five uh, years. And at that point, when Vinny Shirali became commissioner, uh, after a bit of time there, he recruited me to come to probation. And I tell this story because I think it's relevant to the points that I want to make. Uh, I had spent so many years on the outside of the system, um, doing direct service, doing advocacy, uh, definitely a, a critic, uh, considered myself a critic of the system, which I had always considered Vinny to be as well. Uh, so it was certainly very interesting when somebody uh, like him with a philosophy uh, entered into that position. That seemed like a watershed moment in the in the movement, in the work to advocate for real change in systems to better impact youth and families and communities. So I went on to explain to Vinny why I wasn't really right for the job, um, because I had not been a probation officer. I had not worked in government. I had not worked in law enforcement. Um, but had in fact had been on the other side of the equation. And he, his response was that those were the exact reasons uh, why he wanted to recruit me to the position. So the point being that there was a conscious effort to bring new perspectives. It wasn't to disparage those who may have come up and been lifers in the system who had worked for many years, um, but to say that a fresh perspective a perspective that was grounded in the experience of the people and the communities and the families and the youth being impacted uh, was be important to, to in integrate that into a vision for rethinking probation and rethinking juvenile justice. And so when I came to probation, I entered into a space where we were having conversations around justice reinvestment. How could uh, resources uh, be redirected uh, back to the communities most impacted and the communities that were overwhelmingly represented in the justice system on probation and detention in the first place. We were talking about community engagement. Um, why was it important? What was community engagement? How could probation, how could juvenile justice systems engage the communities uh, beyond the sort of traditional supervisory role? But how could they engage people 
in a proactive way to bring supports, to bring services, and to open up opportunities. We were talking about restorative justice. We were talking about the notion of people not being the sum total of their worst mistake or their offense or their delinquency charge, but that there was an opportunity and a need to think with a restorative lens on helping people to, uh, to restore themselves in the community and also restore those in the community who had been harmed, be it individuals, be it families, be it the community itself. All of these conversations were taking place as we were uh, grappling to, to, uh, to, to, to make concrete steps um, and concrete programs and policies that would actually impact the people we were serving in a positive way. And so one of the key results of that, uh, among others, was what we called the Neighborhood Opportunity Network, or the NEONS, of course, where we went into communities and partnered with those on the ground advocating for the populations who were most impacted by the system. Um, and then, of course, the other signature uh, uh, um, program or initiative of probation was Archer's Transformative Mentoring, of course, um, which had uh, been referenced with regards to its impact on recidivism and working with what we now call credible messengers, uh, indigenous people from the community with shared life experiences who had proven track records of commitment and passion and expertise in working with the young people who we were so focused on. That experience, I think, serves as a sort of example, but also a foundation for some of the things that I, I would like to talk about briefly. Um, I would leave New York City and go to Washington, D.C. to become the director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, um, DYRS, and uh, bring these experiences and this perspective uh, with me. Um, but I began to think about something, perhaps what we were doing, and took a step back and think about it, uh, perhaps from a, a, in broader terms or from a different perspective, and that's something that I wanted to share here today. I think that there's been... Clearly, if we look at the history of juvenile justice in this country um, and uh, its evolution, um, we can see that, in fact, it has evolved. There are several examples of such. There are, sadly and uh, disturbingly, still uh, practices that remain in systems um, around the country to this day that are holding on to some of the more horrible practices um, that date back in, in history. Um, you know, such as uh, solitary confinement and, and shackling and pepper spray and these types of things. Um, but yet it's definitely worthy of our attention uh, to, to acknowledge and in fact celebrate many of the reforms that have taken place. And so over time, and certainly over the last 30 years or so, there's been massive reforms, um, uh, or certainly great examples of massive reforms in our system with regards to addressing conditions of confinement, bringing education to young people who are inside of systems, um, mental health services, um, and other types of services and supports, which prior in earlier times was, was, was not, um, certainly was not the standard. Um, it certainly was not the, the rule. Um, and so now, while there are still systems who aren't there yet and are still struggling or perhaps still resistant, standards have been set. Um, examples are clear. Models exist, and the experience is there to show what reform is done. I call that a second wave. If the first wave was a punitive error, I would call the second one a kinder, gentler, smarter, evidence-based, better informed, more humane, wiser uh, approach. Yet, I think the implications for, for us really propel us or should propel us to go further. This second wave, this kinder, gentler, smarter, more informed approach has certainly been very important. But it has been primarily system-driven, system-centered, and without being informed by the voices and the actual experience of those most impacted, um, youth, families, and communities. And so it has certainly represented progress. But I think it, there's a need for us to consider a new identity for our systems. Um, from the punitive, of course, we've moved to a, to a better place in terms of the standards that are being set. But I think 
reform in probation and in juvenile justice has been lacking and therefore fallen short of its goals because it has been so concentrated on making a better system, better training, um, higher standards, all of these are good things. Yet it hasn't looked to the capacity and the expertise that resides inside of the communities themselves where our young people and our families live. And so I've been grappling with and really thinking about this idea of systems taking on a new identity, not as the place and the people and the apparatus, however well informed, however well resourced, that is the source of the answer and the medicine and the cure and the treatment, but systems as facilitators and investors and in building the capacity of the villages that we all say we agree it takes to raise a child. So how can systems invest in the capacity of the village? Well, concretely, I think we began to really push that idea and find some answers in New York at probation as we launched our community initiatives, as we brought community inside to do training with our staff, as we put our staff inside of spaces, inside of nonprofits who were advocates for young people, as we began to listen to families and listen to community advocates and our young people to and listen to their experience. So when I got to Washington, D.C., we took those experiences and pushed them further. And so our main focus and what I wanted to just sort of highlight today in the few minutes that we have left has been to build village or community capacity. And concretely for that, for us, that has looked like the expansion of the Credible Messenger Initiative, uh, building the capacity of leaders, natural leaders inside of communities who are uniquely positioned, who have a unique life experience, who have um, a unique opportunity to build trusting, loving, authentic relationships with those with, to, with whom we are most concerned to help support them and walk with them and advance them towards transformation. And so the narrative has emerged, it emerged in New York, it has emerged in DC of the transformative impact that credible messengers have had um, it has uh, validated our redistributions of funds out of dollars that used to be spent on placing children out of home and residential care and redistribute, redistributing those dollars into the community, into credible messenger programs, which provides the opportunity for folks on the ground to engage our young people, to keep them in the community safely, and to engage them in an array of services and supports and opportunities. But what it's also uh, allowed for has helped to push our vision for greater capacity in community, not just to have impact on young people, um, not just impact on families, but also impact on the system itself, on us. And so we have gone through a massive culture change at DYRS, where credible messenger work is more than the amazing interaction between credible messengers and young people, that certainly is very powerful. But the interaction between credible messengers and our case managers and our mental health specialists and our program directors, they are now at the table of designing with us and with young people and families individualized case plans, treatment plans, supervision plans, designing programs, and in fact at the table designing policy. I share that as a concrete example of what investing in community or village capacity looks like. It looks like real dollars, real commitment, um, and real openness on the part of justice systems to uh, not just share our youth and refer them to innovative programs, but to bring the community inside into the interworkings of our very agencies um, and to do the hard, difficult work of incorporating those voices and those experiences and those insights into our work. And for us, it's continued to result in great success, over 50% reduction in recidivism, but something that I think is um, even more uh, lasting and important is that it has changed the dynamic and the relationship between our justice agency and the communities most impacted and begin to shift power and shift um, responsibility um, and shift 
resources to the communities that are most impacted and where those uh, who are in the greatest need. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me ask, uh, before we go to my colleagues for any questions, I just, quick question, how did you support uh, your probation staff when, when you're making such significant changes uh, in, in culture and policies and, and structure? And you know, how, how did you all get through that? I think that's a great question because uh, I think in, you know inherent in the question is that often there's a there's a there's an urgency of course right there's a there's a time we have to move uh, we know that established agencies often if there's resistance they'll they'll figure out how to wait out until there's a new director with some new crazy idea what have you right and so there's a sense of urgency yet at the same time you, you, it's so critical to get buy-in. Right. So right. Our, our process was certainly providing a frame, uh, providing some non-negotiable values um, in terms of how we were viewing and wanted to uh, uh, support our clients, which caused some culture clash, to say the least. But we went through a process of really meeting probation officers where they were, um, grappling with why did they come to the job in the first place and really defining what success looked like. Right. Um, changing the notion that a violation of probation for some had been defined as a success. It meant you caught the person misbehaving, whereas we defined a violation as a collective failure, right? And that we redefined our role, but really took the time. And it was, a, it, it was, it was, it was intensive and it was um, not easy, but took the time to really have conversations um, to bring community into the table with probation officers. We did retreats with probation officers, um, credible messengers, and young people, where they would spend uh, uh, two or three days on a retreat, reintroducing themselves, right? Beginning to see each other in different light and finding commonality. So it was not, certainly not an easy process, but I think by uh, the combination of putting probation officers in spaces in community uh, with advocates and people doing the work on a daily basis and also bringing in community members and advocates and credible messengers into our space, we've created an atmosphere for people to be, to, 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 to put away some of their preconceived notions, which, which existed on both sides, right? Um, to begin to find some commonality and to begin to see some culture change. And so, um, that's just the, there's, in my opinion, there's no way around that. Um, you have to do that work um, while continuing to push the uh, agenda forward. But I think a lot of people found that it was, it was, it, it was something that made sense. Um, it was having better impact on our clients. Um, and at the end of the day, it was better for public safety. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to my colleagues. I know uh, Vice Chair Vargas has a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lacey. I think all of your um, comments were like music to my ears and my heart. Um, I think you, you spoke to my soul and I really am just really thrilled about um, the perspective of community and community engagement. Um, I was wondering, in terms of engaging parents, and you know, I know you didn't have a lot of time to be able to go uh, deep, deeper dive, but I served on the board of the Parent Institute for Quality Education and I know the power, you know, I think in, in our community, we have the grandparents connection and some other groups that have really uh, been exceptional uh, for, for really being that support for our students, but uh, for our young people, right? Um, what has been, what was the experience in terms of, of, of that, that building with parents? Because what I have learned for many years is that sometimes parents may or may not have the tools, right, uh, to be able to, to, be able to uh, support or assist and, and or they're just extremely busy and there's a lot of other things going on. So I, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on that and your perspective. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I think, um, you know, I think sort of from a broad perspective, some of the unintended consequences perhaps um, perhaps sometimes intended, but I think often unintended consequences of even the evolution of family court and juvenile process and the system is marginalized parents, right? Um, and so some very well-intended people for, for, for years and some still hold on to these notions like, you know, Clinton, he's not a bad kid, right? He just has horrible parents, right? Or he's not, it's just the family. It's the families, it's not the kids. You hear that often, right? But if we unpack that, we start to see that it's really, it's like a problematic way of viewing it. 
um, we don't gloss over or ignore the tremendous challenges um, that exist in families, right? As you said, there's some real uh, capacity issues. There's some real challenges, be they mental health, substance abuse, crisis, what have you, or just busy and overwhelmed, right? Um, but we sort of flipped that and said, um, inside of families, were, there were solutions. But if we could engage them and support families, then we could begin to, uh, uh, again, help build their capacity to be who they want to be and, and need to be for their children. So we expanded Credible Messenger in DC to where now the caregivers have their own Credible Messengers. So it's not just the young people, the young person who has their transformative mentor, or credible messenger. Now grandma has one, or mom, or dad, or whoever the adult caregiver is. And so we have credible messenger teams, in essence, who, who um, work collectively, yet they individually will work with the different pieces or parts of that young person's ecosystem, most importantly, parents or adult caregivers. So they're getting a level of attention that's really unprecedented. Um, and then in addition to that, we just do robust, robust family engagement, um, family groups. We take our families on retreats. Um, we, we do restorative circles with our families and it's a way to build trust and relationships. And, and then also it opens the door when there is higher level need of, 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 of specialists, be they behavioral health specialists or what have you. You know, it opens the door for the technologies that we do have um, and the expertise that we do have. Um, it, it opens the door for those to become uh, trusted and useful for families. And so I think that just being really intentional about that, taking the time to do it, um, dedicating staff to uh, um, spending their time and their thoughts and their energies on family engagement is, uh, I think, a really important thing that's intrinsically important uh, for the development and the, the healing and the treatment and the, the, the growth of our youth and families. It also uh, has served, I think it's worth saying, to develop a stakeholder group and empower a stakeholder group or help them empower themselves who support what we're doing, right? And so now, you know, our, our, our civic leaders, our city council, our mayor's office, um, they hear from the community about this approach. They, there's, a, there's a huge support, there's a huge outcry for continuing this, uh, this body of work, which I think is really valuable um, for systems that are struggling with culture change and struggling to get the, even the, frankly, the political support to, to continue to push in this direction community, uh, grandmothers, children, families behind the work, I think has just been really important. Thank you for that. I was just, um, you know, I'm assuming a lot of it is based on trauma-informed care, right? And and wondering, you know, I, I'm, I'm making assumptions here, but many of our families already have that trauma, specifically dealing with law enforcement and or sure. um, you know, with what probation might have meant to them as well. And so I was wondering, the last question is, um, you know, how much involvement is there? Like, you know, it, it, does it vary by by communities? I'm just trying to think about it. And I think it goes back to Chair Fletcher's uh, question regarding sort of how do you shift uh, within, you know, what the role of probation is and, and their engagement um, at this level, right? Because I don't think, I, I'm not, you know, they're, they're not case managers, right? Or they're not, the, the social service piece of it is not really, I think what has been intended. So I was wondering um, a little bit about that. Well, yes, definitely. The first part of your question, definitely trauma-informed. We trained our entire department um, in trauma and in varying levels, depending on those who engage youth and families, and also um, very uh, heavy emphasis connected to the trauma um, piece is the is resiliency. You know, um, Dr. Sean Jen Wright's done a lot of work on that and others about resiliency, right? So it's about the trauma and understanding that, but it's about building on the resiliency factor. So that's just a huge part of the way we think about the work. Um, but also with regards to the touch or the sort of level of interaction with, with systems, you know, what's happened with the, if, if I interpret your question correctly, what's happened is, you know, the credible messengers represent um, a key um, layer of support that's hands-on, that lives in the community, that's 24-7, that is not 
um, authoritative but supportive, but yet is in relationship with those in authority, right? So at the end of the day, DYS still has legal authority over the youth committed to us, right? We know that, That's, we don't pretend that we don't, but we have, are able to step back and our case managers now who, have, who are sort of analogous to a probation officer, because um, they're responsible for community supervision at the end of the day and can have a child remanded to detention, right? they are able to now team up with credible messengers and form this team approach to engagement, right? Um, and they don't have to be hands-on in the way that previously it may have been thought, right? Um, they're able to, to, to I sort of use the football analogy, uh, to sort of quarterback the play, but, you know, and, 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 and know what the individualized plan is, but we have this array of stakeholders, we have credible messengers, we have family who are critical to orchestrating the actual progress towards achieving the goals that the young person has. So what it has done is, um, we, know that, we know that jails are artificial settings, but you know, frankly, and some of my best friends are POs, but frankly, relationships with law enforcement authority figures are artificial as well. It doesn't mean that you can't form a real authentic relationship, but the nature of it itself, right, is not something that's natural to a child. So if you can bring, surround them in their ecosystem with loving, caring folks who are going to be there after they're off probation, which is the key, then, and infuse into that relationship uh, steps and progress and communication towards very real important goals, then collectively uh, we can have success. And so I think that's been as a sort of um, example, uh, illustration of how uh, uh, a system, or in this case, a case manager can invest and support the capacity of others who really ultimately will have to sustain everything that we're trying to do. And so we have to put them in the forefront of the work. And I think that's an example of the way we work. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's go to Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, I actually really appreciate this um, presentation and all the work that you do and have done. I have a bit of a, a different kind of question. I mean, obviously you come, you know, from an advocacy background, you know, you know, from the outside, really working on focusing on reform. Um, and I'm wondering if when you kind of got into that position to drive that reform agenda, if you had any insights or lessons of sort of priorities that you had coming in that you decided actually were not actionable or actually were not good ideas once uh, you were kind of in the position of trying to implement them um, and that you are then sort of now taking back to the Vera Institute and saying, you know, here are my lessons learned about our advocacy agenda that we might want to approach differently, um, you know, once you are in that implementation seat? That's a, that's a really a great question. I think we tried to, and certainly going back to New York with probation and then DC, we made up our minds that there were gonna be certain non-negotiables in terms of the way we um, intended to serve our clients and the types of, um, of, of measures we would take, um, you know, ban the box and trying to deal with collateral consequences of people with felonies and, um, trying to help them with education and housing and employment. Like those were things that we were not going to back away from. But we had obviously, and your question is great, we had to make decisions. You know, when we got to probation, we, we inherited a, a, a force um, that had been armed with nine millimeters and, you know, um, and some, a lot of implications of that. And, you know, through great struggle and conversation, we ultimately decided not to take that on as an issue to disarm the force, for example, because we thought, and if I could say from my perspective, that it, there wasn't time, that that might derail, and we were going to lose people who were going to get on board with what we were doing, but they don't, don't take their gun, right? So that, that was a whole controversial issue. So, so, so there's an example of something where I think at the top, we didn't, we did we did not like the idea of armed POs and we didn't think it was necessary or made a lot of sense, but we didn't, you know, take on that issue. Um, so I think there's, you know, various sort of um, points at which you make some decisions and choose your battles, but you, um, you don't compromise. Now, at, in New York, I often joke about this, uh, you know, they, and it's not a joke, but, you know, it was controversial at first to rename, to stop saying defendants and offenders and probationers, and we started saying clients, 
which may not even be the best, greatest word, but that was a that was a cultural struggle, right? Um, which you know, but it it caught on, and you know, at one point I said, well, listen, don't you know? When someone said they refused to call them clients, I was like, well, don't you know? I don't want you to hurt yourself trying. So, but treat them appropriately, right? Um, I never used what I call the L word at probation. We, we talked about compassion. We talked about care, right? Um, we talked about empowerment. These were controversial terms um, for some, not for all. Uh, when I got to DC, we, I, I, I finally said, and we were explicit about love, right? Love in the sense that Martin Luther King said, true justice is an act of love and public policy. We said we were gonna love our youth, love our families, love each other and build our work on that foundation. I think if I had walked in the door in New York when I got to probation and said that, I would have, <laughs> I would have, I would have lost the pretty, uh, the little bit of credibility I may have walked in with, um, um, for some. Uh, and DC, you know, we made a decision, and there was certainly, I guess, culturally, it, it seemed more viable. But I guess I share all of that just to say, you know, language is important, um, and you know, but you make decisions on how you communicate, when you communicate. Uh, but at the end of the day, the core values of what you're going to try to do, I think, and again, the limited time that we have in these roles, it's really important for us to push forward. And the good news is that there's, while some people get stuck in the old ways um, and there's very, various complications, a lot of people get on board with, uh, with what we're trying to do because, it, because of the two points, again, what really helps develop people and helps put them on the right trajectory and something that, you know, perhaps isn't talked about enough by folks like me. Um, this, is, this is public safety, right? This is, this is what's good. This is what helps to make safe families and communities and safer streets, right? At the end of the day, with something that we all care about. Um, and, and so this is good policy um, that, that ends up being what's good for the community. And, and that's something that I think is important to communicate as you struggle to pick your battles. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I, um, I think, you know, Mr. Lacey, even when you talk about just changing a word, right? How, how just, just changing a word, it's not a policy, it's not a procedure, it's just a word. Uh, you know, anytime you try and change anything, right, you're going to run into opposition and, uh, and fear and, and a lot of that. <laughs> I love your line. I don't want you to hurt yourself just trying to uh, use a different word. Right. Uh, right. And, and, you know, I, I think we're really committed as a county. Um, you know, when it comes to criminal justice reform, look, we don't just want to be performative. We want to be substantive. Um, and, and the policies and the procedures matter, but the language does too. And, and, and when we're talking about how, how, how these kids feel, um, and do they feel engaged? Do they feel loved? Do they feel like this is someone who believes in them um, and wants them to have a better future? And so, um, you know, we just, we got to kind of keep, keep going, but I, I really appreciate everything uh, you've brought to us today. And, and I know you've been engaged with our county a lot and with a lot of folks here, and, and we're very grateful for your time and your effort. Um, let me ask real quick if, uh, if uh, Supervisor Anderson or any of my other colleagues have any thoughts uh, they want to share. If not, we will move on to our next uh, panel. I just want to thank you for uh, your hard work. Uh, I work very hard in the state legislature on restorative justice. It's not an easy road, but we know in many states like Texas and other states that are, they've had a lot of great success. And it's not, uh, it, it shouldn't be a partisan issue, but in too many states it is. And I think that here in the county, we have a real opportunity to make a difference. So I, thank you uh, today for your testimony. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's great to meet you all. Congratulations okay. on the work you all are leading. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lacey. Uh, now we're gonna we're gonna go to our next section. We're gonna hear a little bit uh, from a little external to a little internal uh, look. Uh, we're gonna hear uh, from Scott Wezar, the uh, Executive Deputy Chief Youth Development and Community Services, uh, Mark Riger, Chief of Contracts and Programs, San Diego County Probation, and Sandy McGrair, the CEO of the Children's Institute. And then after all three of them present, uh, then we'll come back for board member comments. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. And thank you, Mr. Lacey and Mr. Mohammed, for your national leadership on justice, juvenile justice reform. In the last 10 years, juvenile arrest rates have significantly decreased across the nation 
in California and in San Diego. Our local juvenile arrests have decreased 79% over a 10 year period. This decrease has resulted in the number of youth on probation with a decrease of 4,324 in 2010 to 776 on February 1st of 2021. As of last week, we have 783 youth on juvenile probation. And as of last night, I'm happy to report that we hit an all time low of 155 youth detained in our juvenile detention facilities. While this decrease is significant in sheer numbers, it is also important to note the biggest decline is youth committing misdemeanors. This means that many of the youth we now serve are youth who have been involved in the juvenile justice system for longer portions of their life. They've experienced increased trauma, had significant educational disruptions, have been exposed to violence, have been exposed to systematic racism, substance abuse, and poverty. Understanding the circumstances and environments our youth deal with is very important as we discuss therapeutic interventions and the types of services and facilities that best support our youth. Additionally, I would like to note our current demographics for our youth uh, on probation, 58% Hispanic, 19% black, 16% white, 3% Asian, and 3% other. Understanding this information guides us in developing our agency goals and priorities as we move forward. The following remarks will outline some of the work we are currently doing to support probation youth services as we navigate juvenile justice reform in San Diego, as well as our continued work we hope to complete in the upcoming year. In April of 2017, the Board of Supervisors approved the probation department to apply for technical assistance from Georgetown University's Center for Juvenile Justice Reform to implement the nationally recognized youth in custody practice model. This was the beginning of our juvenile justice transformation efforts in San Diego County. With the technical assistance and guidance from juvenile justice reform experts, we've begun to shift from a punitive correctional model to a positive youth development model. This shift will take years to fully implement and require strong probation leadership and a county commitment to implement evidence-based trainings throughout our department, a new standalone juvenile training unit, department-wide cultural transformation, and a shift in recruitment and hiring practices. Using the youth in custody practice model as our guide in our institutions, we have worked to identify and improve living conditions for our youth in juvenile hall and urban camp. Examples include the increased availability of visitation for our youth and their families or other caring adults, improved meal quality, and improved bedding and hygiene products, to name a few. We've also worked to improve the working conditions for our staff in the detention facilities, including the addition of designated break rooms, out of unit break opportunities, and increasing staff to youth ratios which allow for positive engagement. But please note, we are somewhat restricted in the improvements that we can make due to the age and limitations of our current facility. In November of 2019, probation department representatives, including management and line staff, along with justice and collaborative partners, participated in the Transforming Juvenile Probation Capstone Program at Georgetown University. This program, paved the way for the development of our youth for our youth services three-year strategic action plan. This action plan is a roadmap for juvenile field services and juvenile institutions that applies evidence-based practices to improve outcomes for our youth and their families and addresses the needs of our staff, knowing that staff support is a critical piece to successfully implement the positive youth development model. In addition to the development of a new mission, vision, and core values, we've also developed core beliefs working with our justice and collaborative partners. Additional goals include expanding clinical assessments and services provided by our community-based programs. We are expanding these contracts to include early trauma and mental health assessments and provide clinical services 
before a youth escalates in the juvenile justice system. Also, we are enhancing our services in our detention facilities in training all youth services staff on national best practices such as trauma-informed care and implicit bias. Our newly developed Youth Services Action Plan will provide the foundation to transform our juvenile probation division into a positive youth development agency that focuses on supporting justice-involved youth, not only successfully exiting the juvenile justice system, but reaching their full potential. Another area of focus in our action plan is the development of the disposition matrix, which is a data-driven, evidence-based tool. The disposition matrix is crucial in addressing disparities in the decision-making process and recommendation options for sentencing. The matrix was developed with national experts and our local partners to reduce subjective decisions that are made by our probation officers. The matrix evaluates the crime committed and the current risk to recidivate score of each youth to determine appropriate sentencing recommendations. The use of the matrix mitigates unconscious bias and has proven to address racial and ethnic disparities and successfully reduces recidivism. Also in 2019, the Board of Supervisors approved the probation department to contract with the Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators to examine our conditions of confinement and conduct a thorough assessment of our use of force, including the use of chemical and physical restraints, de-escalation, and room confinement in our juvenile detention facilities. As a result of this study, our department is transitioning away from law enforcement defensive tactics training and replacing it with a nationally recognized, evidence-based de-escalation training called the MANT system. This new approach integrates understanding the impacts of ch adverse childhood trauma with promoting and demonstrating principles of positive behavior support, much like what is done with normal parenting techniques. This nationally recognized approach creates safer and healthier environments, not only for the youth, but has proven that staff are safer in institutions as the culture and practices change. Mark Regeer will, will discuss this training in more detail in a few minutes. A data-driven recommendation in this report that we've adopted is the use of performance-based standards, or PBS. PBS has been recognized by national experts as an except, exceptional juvenile facility improvement tool. PBS uses 100 outcome measures and national performance standards to guide facility operations in the implementation of quality proven programs that best serve staff, youth, and families. PBS is currently used in more than 200 juvenile facilities across the nation, and the research has demonstrated that by using PBS, better outcomes have been achieved, such as reduced incidence of room confinement, improved academic success, greater adherence to institution policies, and safer environments for our staff and youth. We are at the beginning stages of implementing PBS and look forward to coming back to your board to highlight improvements and identify areas where we may need additional support. We are also working on the new requirements of Senate Bill 823, which is the closure of the California Department of Juvenile Justice, or DJJ. We currently have 55 youth in DJJ and historically about 15 youth per year from San Diego have been sent to DJJ. Starting July 1st of this year, these, new, these newly ju uh, adjudicated youth will remain in San Diego under the care of the probation department. We've been working with our justice partners and the Juvenile Justice Task Force, SANDAG, and the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council to identify important programs and services required to meet the needs of these youth. A subcommittee of the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council will be established to develop a comprehensive service model, including ensuring these youth can complete high school and have opportunities for higher education and opportunities for training in career and technical education skills that translate to apprenticeships, internships, and employment. 
as we jointly develop our local plan with our stakeholders, we will work together to identify how to allocate the money we receive from the state for this population to support staffing custodial needs and addressing community supervision needs once the youth is released from custody. We will expand our partnership with behavioral health services for in-custody and in-community clinical services. We will develop contracts with community-based organizations to provide services in our detention facilities and in the community. We commit to provide a comprehensive plan to this board within the next six months. In closing, there are many projects that we are currently working on, such as reducing the number of probation conditions and opening a third achievement center, which provides community-based services to improve outcomes for our youth. We are currently using an evidence-based tool to assess the risk to recidivate, but will also work with behavioral health services to find additional assessments to, ad to identify early mental health and trauma needs. Our continued focus is to support youth with community-based programs and services in the communities in which they live and to provide them pathways to successfully exit probation and become productive citizens. As we move forward, we will continue to seek your support in implementing evidence-based trainings throughout our department, developing a new standalone juvenile training unit by July 1st of this year, and adopting enhanced recruitment and hiring practices. We will seek your support and leadership as we continue to create a department-wide cultural transformation. I would now like to turn over the presentation to Mark Regeer, Chief of Contracts and Programs at the Probation Department to provide an update on how we are supporting staff. Mark. Thank you, Scott. One of the most critical pieces in juvenile justice transformation is supporting staff and how that translates to better outcomes for the clients we serve. After all, it is the staff who are the ones working with youth and their families on a daily basis. If we expect better outcomes for youth, that starts with making sure we not only provide our staff the highest level of training, but that we identify and recruit those individuals with the unique passion and skill set to best work with our justice involved population and their families. We recognize that training is a critical part of empowering our staff to change young people's lives. As recently as December 2019, the Council for Juvenile Justice Administrators recommended an overhaul of our juvenile training model. They recommended that all youth focused trainings be separated from adult so youth staff can receive evidence based youth focused trainings that better support them in working with adolescents who have very different experiences and needs than our adult population. Specifically, the experts highlighted our current defensive tactics training taught to juvenile correctional officers, which is a common law enforcement curriculum that does not emphasize relationship building and de-escalation, and instead emphasizes a hands-on approach to safety that is not consistent with national best practices. And we've begun to take steps to address the recommendations. In 2019, the Board of Supervisors authorized the Probation Department to receive trainings from the acclaimed San Diego State University's Academy for Professional Excellence. The Academy is the California Department of Social Services designated training entity for all Southern California child welfare departments and has been training our own child welfare services for the past 25 years on evidence-based practices. By June 30th, probation will train almost all juvenile officers and many of our non-sworn staff on the topics of adolescent brain development, trauma-informed care, implicit bias, and restorative practices. But we're not done. As SDSU's Academy of Professional Excellence has taught us, we must continue to ensure we reach all staff and provide ongoing coaching and refresher trainings to ensure the lessons and strategies learned are being utilized by staff with consistency and fidelity to the models. In CJJA's assessment of our juvenile detention facilities, the national experts recommended we use the MANT system as our primary training curriculum in place of the current defensive tactics course previously highlighted. You heard Scott mention this a few minutes ago, but what is the MANT? Well, it's a 180 degree change in how we train staff to interact with youth who are detained. The nationally recognized operating philosophy for MANT is that safety is grounded in, relate in building positive relationships between youth and staff. Safety is the foundation for supporting youth with positive behavioral change. In the MANT, staff are able to identify at-risk behaviors, youth in crisis, and youth beginning to deregulate and take the appropriate action before disruption or violence can occur. 
because the curriculum is 80% prevention and verbal de-escalation focused. Curriculum topics include healthy communication, conflict resolution, positive behavior support, and trauma-informed care. However, as a juvenile justice agency, there may still be times where physical interventions are necessary to protect youth and other staff. For this reason, the MANT system offers additional courses to teach staff these critical skills safely and effectively. And the, MANT, and the data proves the MANT program is successful when properly implemented. In Mississippi, over a three-year period, they experienced a significant reduction in seclusion or isolation and a reduction in use of restraints. But this is not a one-time training. Once staff master these skills in the first year, annual refresher courses are necessary to avoid lost knowledge and maintain fidelity to the program. These trainings are a step in the right direction, but that's what they are, a step in the right direction. They're not the journey. We will return to the board in the very near future to seek your approval for a comprehensive training contract with San Diego State University's Academy for Professional Excellence to transform our juvenile training and support our work to develop a standalone youth-specific training division within the probation department. This new contract will include full implementation of the nationally recognized MANT system next fiscal year, trainings focused on cultural competency and eliminating disparities in decision-making, motivational interviewing, developing comprehensive case plans that include strengths and not just areas of improvement for youth, and coaching services for supervisors and managers during the transformation. But all these trainings must be specific and offered through the lens of youth development. Our youth staff need a training model that helps them understand why young people have differing levels of decision-making, critical thinking, and comprehension that do not match adults. While many of our 16 and 17-year-olds look like adults, they're not. They're still learning and growing adolescents. And brain science tells us that young people are impulsive, they're prone to risk-taking, and they may even negatively respond to authority figures, but that does not make them dangerous to the community. Unlike with adults, young people don't finish their brain development until their mid-20s, and our responses to behaviors can significantly shape their long-term success. Providing evidence-based trainings that support our youth and their families with the appropriate interventions, linkage to services in their home communities, and understanding complex youth needs means fewer youth on juvenile probation, a significant reduction in youth transitioning to the adult system, and thriving communities for all. When it comes to training, it's equally important that our professional staff receive the same support to best support our clients and the community. Over the past few months, we've been working with our professional staff to develop a new hire training program with topics covering our probation case management system, communication, including customer service and de-escalation, workflow, and to support the court process. These trainings support both adult and youth professional staff as we seek to provide the highest quality of customer service to our clients, staff, and justice partners. In early 2019, the Council for Juvenile Justice Administrators released a comprehensive toolkit for juvenile justice agencies to transition to a youth-serving culture and improve overall staff working conditions. Although we are limited peace officers in the justice system, it's important that our job descriptions reflect the national best practices for being a youth-serving agency that supports the long-term success of our region's young people. CJJA and their national experts noted that many agencies across the country are aligning their job titles and core competencies to support a workforce that is restorative, strength-based, and trauma-informed, and one that focuses on reducing racial and ethnic disparities with descriptors like youth development, support, or counselors. Job classifications, recruitments, and brochures are an essential part of juvenile justice transformation. Words matter, and they reflect an organization's values and desired outcomes for helping our region's youth avoid and exit the justice system while keeping our community safe. It is our goal as a department and juvenile justice system that we work closely with our labor associations this year to ensure our job classifications reflect national best practices and years of research in the positive youth development philosophy and move away from a correctional control-based model that is demonstrated to not best support youth family, and community needs. And now more than ever, we're asking staff to learn how to build relationships, understand impulsive behaviors, and identify traumatic warning signs so we can help youth heal, improve their academic standing, and transition out of the justice system. CJJA recommended juvenile detention agencies focus their recruitment efforts to non-traditional academic fields like child developments, education, schools of social work, psychology, sociology, and other areas where our community providers already recruit from and serve the same population. 
To achieve this, we will forge relationships with local universities like San Diego State and Cal State San Marcos. We want to be their graduating students' employer of choice to continue making a difference in the lives of San Diego's youth. CJJA recommended agencies build those relationships by making regular classroom presentations and participating in, in college job fairs. Their recommendations support an agency that is trauma-informed and able to meet the unique needs of the population that's under our care. We have a lot on our plate, but we're excited to work with your board in carrying out your vision of supporting youth, families, and communities. We will, work to, we will look forward to working with you in addressing the actions that still need to be accomplished to meet national standards and best practices in the field of juvenile justice transformation. While we have started many efforts, there is much to do to ensure youth who encounter our juvenile justice system are provided with what they need to flourish and grow. Next, I will turn it over to Sandy McBrayer, CEO of the Children's Initiative, to discuss our youth transition campus in Kearney Mesa and youth's unique needs. Sandy. Thank you very much, Mark and Scott, and all of our speakers today. I am pleased to have the opportunity to share with your board the support we're offering to children and youth and families, and also to discuss our work in the future. I must start with how uncommon it is for a nonprofit leader to be here as a partner with a county government and more specifically with the probation department. As Clinton mentioned, partnerships like this are not the norm in most governments. And I must give credit to Helen Robbins Meyer, Holly Porter, and other county execs who strive to hear from and actively and openly include community partners and community voice. Working as a collective team with probation is rare. And we are routinely asked how San Diego has built and sustained a unique public-private partnership. Other counties have witnessed San Diego's juvenile reform efforts, and they want to replicate our successes. As we readily admit, we're still learning from others. San Diego Juvenile Probation holds true to the belief that they cannot do this work alone. This is not a slight, but an asset. Because by recognizing this, the Juvenile Probation has built strong partnerships with the Juvenile Court Bench, Public Defender, Child Welfare, DA, and many other community stakeholders where they, where they routinely seek their input, their feedback, and their guidance. We are on the path that both Clinton and David mentioned, inclusion, hearing voices from youth, from families, but it's the beginning of the path. My agency, the Children's Initiative, has had the opportunity to bring forth innovative, data-driven strategies to support better outcomes for youth and families. We've been able to show probation and our justice stakeholders what is possible in juvenile justice reform. We have shared national best practices and brought to San Diego, as you see today, the best of the best from across the nation who have implemented evidence-based methods and services. We've also had the opportunity to bring our justice stakeholders to detention facilities across the country to see promising programs and facilities that are supportive, trauma-informed, and caring all to have better outcomes for youth and to continue to support our local learning. As Clinton mentioned, we must start with core beliefs. And you heard Scott mention that we have designed those in San Diego with our justice partners, where families and children are first, where we recognize that serving them is our job. One of the most important things and long lasting efforts we've undertaken is to build a new therapeutic rehabilitative youth transition campus in Kearney Mesa. As many of you know, and some of you have had the chance to visit, phase one of our youth transition campus, led by the Department of General Service, is a design build project for a new urban camp. These are kids who are committed to the, by the court to a specific sentence of incarceration. Phase one, while the beginning of our transition campus, is starting with a 96-bed therapeutic trauma-informed facility. California law states that if we have to incarcerate youth, we must do so in a home-like environment. So all of our efforts on this campus are based on that premise and on the years of research that has demonstrated how can you build a safe and supported living environment for young people when they're away from their home. In phase one, there will be eight 12-bed housing units, not 30 to a unit, not 25. Research says 
12, build relationships. It helps youth and it's safer for staff. There'll be a visiting center where families and other supportive adults can stay connected with youth. The Vera Institute research demonstrated that by increasing the number of caring adults visiting youth while they're incarcerated, the safety in facilities increases. Youth perform better in schools and they had far more success returning to their families and communities. There'll be a standalone school and for the first time, a career and technical education center for media arts, the trades, information technology, as well as a culinary arts teaching classroom and culinary arts kitchen adjacent to the cafeteria. There will be indoor and outdoor recreation areas for youth, including grass and trees. In fact, 30% of the entire campus is designated as outdoor space, and we will have a 3,800 foot garden complete with fruit trees and vegetables. We will have a separate dining hall and outdoor dining patio for staff. We'll have a staff gym so staff can work out before and after work. We know that we must take care of staff who work in our institutions. It is a difficult job and we are committed to supporting our staff both by safety and health. On the new campus, we'll have multiple buildings and functions that will support phase one and the upcoming proposed phase two, including medical, laundry, and maintenance. The projected occupancy for phase one is October of this calendar year. The proposed phase two is for our short, shorter term youth, those who have been arrested but have not gone through the court process. This phase will have six 12 bed living units, a school and recreation space. This phase will also include a 15,000 square foot office space to replace the current leased space for probation administration. Bringing probation administration closer to the clients that we serve. Phase two is in the planning phases and is included in the capital improvement needs assessment update that will be presented to your board on March 16th. As you heard from David, California law requires us to incarcerate certain types of crimes. We must be able to have an environment to hold those youth where we can support them, where we can support learning, where we can support their growing. As we continue to try to reduce our population, we will still be left with young people that need to be in our facilities. We must make sure our facilities support their growth to help them exit the justice system. I'm happy to say that both phase one and phase two will comply with the LEED gold certification. And I also have to say that every day as a partner with the county, I learn more than I ever knew I wanted to. I now can talk about optimized energy performance, low emitting materials, stormwater treatment, and heat island reduction as we work to the county's goals for zero net energy and to reduce our carbon footprint. I would like to switch quickly to community programming. Our county has committed more than 95% of funding from the state allocation of the Juvenile Justice Crime Prevention Act to programs operated by community-based organizations. With additional funding from the probation budget, this equates to more than $16 million annually for prevention and early intervention services. David mentioned that LA is beginning, beginning within just the last year to do what we have done for multiple years. In fact, they're modeling our efforts with our task force and our Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council to say, how do we get money into the community? How do we make sure that our young people are supported so we don't meet them? But if we do, how do we make sure that they can get back into their communities and programs are available for them? We have community assessment teams aimed at keeping at-risk youth from contact with law enforcement, diversion programs for youth who commit low-level misdemeanors, alternative detention programs for youth who commit a higher level misdemeanor and or a low level felony. We have the choice program and achievement centers, all for youth on probation to ensure they do not violate their conditions of probation as David mentioned, and that they are not reincarcerated. These programs are annually, annually evaluated by the San Diego Association of Governments to ensure that we are getting the best outcomes for youth. With the significant numbers of reduction that Scott mentioned earlier, these programs are testament that they are successfully reducing the number of youth incarcerated 
and on probation. But one area we still have a significant gap in is the more intense needs of some of our youth on probation. If Judge Espana, a presiding judge of juvenile court, who is a rock star, if she were here today, she would say we must talk about the mental health and substance abuse issues some of our youth face. Probation, the juvenile bench, behavioral health services are committed to finding additional connections and solutions to support our youth who struggle with mental health and substance abuse. Many of these youth and their families grapple with finding the help they need due to lack of access, limited bed space for long-term inpatient or residential care, and the disparities of private insurance benefits, services, and wait times. We recognize that we must do more to help these youth and their families. While there is much more I could share, our time is limited. I want you to know that all of us are committed to transforming our juvenile justice system to one of rehabilitation, support, and care. I wish I could explain to you what a second or third or at times even a fourth chance can mean to a young person. It is an opportunity for them to grow, to learn, and to thrive. It is all of us. It is our collective efforts that can change a young person's life trajectory and provide a future they didn't even know they could strive for. We are excited to work with this board as we address the many issues we have mentioned. As a partner, we are committed to never give up. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all of our uh, presenters. Let me go to my colleagues and see if we have any uh, questions or comments from, uh, from any of them. I see Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you so much. It was really interesting and really helpful. I wanted to return to kind of tying the threads together from our original presentations, the first one in the morning, which was really looking at costs associated with the, the juvenile justice system. And there was a number that uh, really struck me. I think it was $493,000 for a bed. Um, and I, I just wanted to get some sense of what is that in our um, in our county, you know, what are the, what are the costs associated, you know, per bed, um, and and what that cost structure looks like uh, in relationship to what was discussed by the first presenter. Thank you, Vice. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Lawson Remmer. Uh, as it relates to our uh, budget, what we have in institutional services, which is divided by the number of youth that we currently have in custody, our uh, our average amount is about $400,000. We got to take into account uh, the COVID and how that impacted our current population. Our pro population has uh, seen a, a reduction over the last 12 months, uh, but we're currently sitting at about $400,000 per bed uh, annually. Thank you. And can I say, um, Supervisor Lawson Raymer, yes. Scott said COVID also required us from um, the California Health Department to have automatically smaller units and quarantine units. So we have more staff currently in our facilities because of just the sheer number that is allowed within a unit. So our numbers previously were under 400,000, but during the COVID time, that is the number we're at currently. Can I just have a quick follow up on that, um, on the co given COVID? you know, what, are there any lessons learned from COVID regarding um, the population of our juvenile offenders that could be a not detained, you know, that, that we have, uh, you know, released because of COVID that we, you know, might look at that as lessons learned moving forward. Um, you know, $400,000 is a pay for, you know, 20 years of college. Yeah. And thank you, supervisor. So two things. One is we began to look at who we were detaining. And in March of um, 2020, we actually worked with all of our police chiefs following national best practices right at the beginning of COVID and changed our policy to not detain misdemeanors. Research says that those kids are not a threat to themselves or community, which is the statute and the law for detainment. So we actually, all the chief police chiefs signed off. We have a couple exceptions to that. So that immediately dropped our population. We also began to look at early release policies. We were one of the first counties, and many counties actually borrowed our early release policies to say, who, what part of your sentence have you served, and are you a threat to the community or to others? And can you still be held accountable but released to the community? And so we've taken all of those into consideration to continue to look at our population to say, 
who needs to be in our facilities, what's required under the letter of the law, and who can we provide more intensive services to in the community. Um, but as David mentioned, that there are some populations we are required as a county to detain in our facilities. Just what, sorry, one last follow-up. So from a numerical standpoint, uh, based on what like what you just recounted in terms of um, you know sort of taking a closer look at who needs to be detained and who you know potentially can can be um, you know supported uh, better outside of our facilities, um, what is the overall uh, percentage, and what is the corresponding you know sort of per bed uh, you know I, I wouldn't want to say cost, but I mean I'm really trying to better wrap my head around. You know what? What are the lessons learned on effectively supporting our youth um, that also might be more cost efficient? Um, difficult question. Um, I think that we, I mean, first, if we go upstream, how do we keep kids from com contact with our our system to start with? Um, but when they're in the system, you know, there is. Um, a belief that probation does all. And so oftentimes young people are detained in probation um, for behavioral health, substance abuse. And so the lesson that we've learned as we've begun to have less um, misdemeanors and other nonviolent kids, they're out into the community. And what we have in our facility are kids who are have much higher needs. So one of the lessons we've learned is we, as Clinton actually mentioned, um, bringing in more intense interventions for our young people. Because if we don't solve the mental health and substance abuse, it's just going to be a repetitive door. They're going to come back over and over again. So one of the things that we've seen is that we have less kids, they have more intense needs. And so we really partner with behavioral health, bringing in more clinicians into our facilities, which as adding more caring adults, which is a good thing, but also more costs. All right, thank you. Uh, either of my other colleagues have any questions on this? Sandy, quick question for you. What, what do you think the timeline would be? Obviously, we're doing phase one now. Uh, we've heard a lot about phase two. Can you just touch on kind of how phase two is essential to what we're trying to do? And then and then what, what would the possible timeline be uh, if the board were to prioritize phase two? Thank you, Visor. Thank you, Supervisor Fletcher. So as I mentioned, our first facility is a 96 bed facility and phase two is a 72 bed facility. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that currently the facility where we are have the bulk of our young people was built in 1952. And while there is a lot of work on continual maintenance, it is quite costly to the county to keep up with that maintenance. And in the next two to three years, there's significant um, maintenance that needs to happen with HVAC and other things to our 1952 building. The other big difference is that building is, you know, the long dark hallways and covered with razor wire. And um, it is it is a old school detention facility. And phase two will be on that exact same campus as phase one. So we anticipate coming to the board um, with the SENA on March 16th and then working with the Department of General Services through an RFSQ process to look at potential bidders. Um, and so it can move rather quickly um, as we kind of open phase one and then continue the demolition for phase two. But it's important to note that we're gonna have two very different buildings on the same campus and we wanna make sure that we house all of our young people in a therapeutic trauma-informed facility, not half behind razor wire in a 1952 building and literally out the window, a facility that has trees and grass and cottages and a cafeteria. So we don't wanna have a have and have not on that campus. Uh, uh, Chair Fletcher, I know that you had asked a question. I just wanted to say, um, to Sandy, I had uh, the opportunity to tour the facility and. You know, it really struck me right now when you mentioned that, um, you know, the law says that if we must incarcerate youth, we have to be in a home-like environment. Um, and um, I, I just, 
you know, the, the facility itself, and I know that that's not what we're here for today. You know, we're really talking about the, the, the future of probation, what it's going to look like. But I, I appreciate um, the development of really having a trauma-informed um, care facility that really is looking at ensuring that, that our youth are not coming back, right? And, and, um, and I really appreciated that, and I just wanted to highlight that um, today because it, it, uh, it meant a lot to see that there's a lot of efforts from our probation department to ensure uh, that our youth uh, are not going to be part of the system, but instead providing them the tools that they need to get out of the system. So I want to just take it. Thank you, Supervisor Vargas. And just to note, it's also for our staff. You know, they too are working in a building that was built in 1952 that is has a lot of maintenance and repairs. And so we want to give them a place where as we ask them to interact differently with young people, they need to be have that support and success too. You know, having a staff break room is so significant. Having a cafeteria where they can actually go to lunch and not eat in the unit while they're looking at the young people that they're working with. Having space to rejuvenate and recharge and some downtime, you know, they need that in our new facility also. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, over the last few years coming out of watch the evolution of the construction of, of phase one, uh, how the, the physical uh, campus really mirrors and matches the, the overall holistic approach to what we're trying to take. And, and I think that there's much to commend with the direction we're heading and what we're doing. Obviously, uh, we want to see that through and, uh, and, you know, we don't want to create this terrible dichotomy where kids are in one uh, building that is a vestige of 1952, uh, looking through the fence and the concertina wire uh, at different kids who are in a new system. And, and I'm very, very motivated to see what we can do to complete phase two rapidly and quickly um, to, to really allow the, the, the infrastructure to exist to support the approach. Um, and uh, I, I certainly think that's a decision we'll have to make as we move forward as a board, but I, I think that's something that, that's very important um, and, uh, and something that will really help us complete the efforts of what we're trying to do. So uh, thank you to our presenters. Um, I don't see uh, any other uh, uh, questions from our board. We'll move to our next section. We're a little bit behind schedule, um, but uh, we, will, uh, we will move rapidly and, and we'll probably go over uh, the schedule time a little bit. But this is really good content and a really good discussion and really good information uh, about a very important topic. And so Next, we're going to go to state and national trends in adult probation. Uh, we're going to switch a little bit uh, from juvenile and focus a little bit on the adult side. Um, we uh, starting off with the state and national trends is uh, Vincent Schiraldi, a senior research scientist at Columbia University. Uh, Vincent is a national expert on criminal justice policy reform. He founded the Justice Policy Institute and was commissioner of the New York City Probation Department, uh, senior advisor to Mayor Bill de Blasio, director uh, of District of Columbia Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services and a senior fellow at the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. Vincent, we appreciate you uh, taking time to uh, join us today and, and share with us a little bit of your work. I will turn it over. Thanks so much, Chair Fletcher. And I was really glad to hear the uh, conversation that just occurred before this. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of terrific stuff happening in San Diego. And, uh, I'm talking about adult stuff today, but it was great to hear about your uh, your new facility and how hopefully that's going to fit with uh, uh, the approach that the whole department's taken. Um, so uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm former uh, uh, commissioner of New York City probation. And then uh, when, when I went to Harvard, I was part of an executive session on community supervision, which included researchers and probation commissioners and uh, formerly incarcerated people, and we wrote a, a lot of papers that were trying to drive change. And part of what came out of that was the creation of a group of progressive probation and parole commissioners. Uh, your former commissioner Adolfo is on the steering committee of called EXIT. And we're now up to 98 uh, current and former probation commissioners who are members of that. I'm co-chair of that. So uh, you know, I've been working with commissioners around the country, researching this issue, been a commissioner myself, and uh, I'll try to draw on all of that to discuss uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm about to say. These are really watershed times for community supervision. 
no one used to kind of care about this. I remember when I interviewed with Mayor Bloomberg, he admitted that he had already been mayor for over eight years that he never really gave much thought to probation. And uh, I certainly know when I got some legislation passed in Albany, folks just didn't pay much attention to it, even though it's the biggest part of the sentencing system. More people get sentenced to probation than jail, prison, and parole combined. Um, I'm going to start with a little history uh, about the origins and how we got to where we are today. Uh, and uh, I believe, as I said, I think we have a real uh, opportunity to examine not just probation, but really what we want to and can do with people when they've broken the law to help make our communities safer. As our founding statement at Exit says, to make probation smaller, less punitive, and more equitable, restorative, and hopeful. Uh, so probation started in 1841 and uh, was invented by a volunteer Boston bootmaker named John Augustus, sort of a product of enlightenment thinking about the ability to perfect the nature of man, uh, optimism that was reflected in the Declaration of Independence. And it really grew out of a resistance to the harsh punitive nature of the system of the day. Penitentiaries had just been invented and were quickly found to be brutalized. Uh, and the other alternative at the time was still the stocks and pillory, um, uh, you know, uh, corporal punishment. Uh, so Augustus and a, a bunch of his temperance movement friends started going to court in Boston and volunteering uh, to take care of people. They bailed them out with the permission of the court. Uh, they observed them, they watched them, they helped them get jobs and find places to live and clean themselves up and returned them to court. And uh, then you know, if, if the person had been obedient and, and lived by the, the rules, then they, they got out uh, and didn't have to get locked up or put in the stocks. If not, that's the way they went. Um, so that's where it started as a volunteer uh, process. It really flourished and expanded and became government run during the progressive era around the turn of the last century. Um, and that then was a combination of the rehabilitative ethic it was founded with, but also with some level of uh, 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 social control over the teeming numbers of foreign and rural people who were coming into America's cities. America's cities tripled in population in the late uh, 1800s and um, mostly Irish and Eastern European uh, folks and then formerly enslaved people were migrating into cities. And uh, there, was a, there was a sense that there was a need to, to, to control and acculturate them. So uh, this is the combination of the desire to do help and and control the poor that has existed in probation, I would argue, to this day. Uh, but still, its two primary early stated goals were for, to serve as an mm -hmm. alternative to incarceration and to promote public safety primarily through rehabilitating people under its charge. Generally, probation then and probation now were misunderstood and underfunded pretty much from the outset uh, it, it, uh, when uh, the numbers of people going through courts started to dramatically increase, in some respects, it became a way to grease the skids of justice. So we can get this person to plead guilty because uh, they're only going to get probation. I feel like I got something. It wasn't nothing. Uh, and so uh, and, and there were national and local investigations about this early on. I very much complained about uh, probation as a uh, poor service and also uh, the, the real uh, mushrooming, mushrooming of uh, plea bargaining. So, but that's that's the that's the way it existed from its beginnings till about the 1970s. 1970s is when we have the, uh, the, the pivot of our entire nation's criminal justice system to uh, a more punishment-oriented system. The beginning of the war on drugs, the war on crime, uh, and the growth of mass incarceration. So from 1972 to 2009, the prison populations in America grew every single year. If you go back to the 70s, we looked much, much like our European other nations that we generally, Western nations, we compare ourselves to. Uh, then we had a five-fold increase 
in the number of people incarcerated. Uh, and prisons, at least during that time period, had something to fall back on. They, you know, they had punishment, they had incapacitation. Uh, probation really didn't have that. Uh, we weren't incapacitating people on probation and it wasn't viewed as punitive. So the field very much pivoted at that time and started to borrow aspects of its more punitive big brother, the prison system. Uh, we started carrying guns. We started meeting out uh, uh, intermediate sanctions. These are words were unheard of before. We called ourselves community corrections, in essence, um, uh, prisons in communities, put people on intensive supervision probation, started using electronic monitors. Prior to 70s, nobody was doing any of that stuff. It was much more of a social work focus. Um, and so uh, uh, probation populations exploded in kind uh, and right alongside prison populations, giving sort of the lie to the notion that they were really serving as alternatives to incarceration. If they were serving as alternatives to incarceration, as more people got put on probation, fewer people would have been locked up. But prison populations grew about fivefold from uh, during that period of time and probation populations grew about fourfold. Um, research by the University of Minnesota's uh, Michelle Phelps shows a po slightly positive correlation between the number of people put on probation in one year in a jurisdiction and the number of people incarcerated the following year. So writ large, uh, more probation year one means more incarceration in year two. Now we have nationally 4.4 million people on probation and parole, about 2.2 million people in prison and jail. So it's almost as if we said as a nation, if some probation is good, more probation just must be better. But research and experience have shown that's hardly the case. There's clear research showing that low risk people should either not be supervised or supervised as little as possible. We literally make low risk people worse uh, by supervising them and putting them in programs, largely because they start to associate with people with greater risks and start to become friends with them and becoming friends with people with high risk makes you high risk. Uh, when we in New York City put our low risk people and people who are behaving well, who are medium risk, onto kiosk supervision, which was essentially like reporting monthly to an ATM, uh, it allowed us to focus more heavily on people with higher risks. Uh, and then recidivism rate research by Fordham showed that recidivism rates for both the high risk people and the low risk people fell. The low risk people, because as I said, they're not sitting in the waiting room for two hours waiting to talk to their PO, surrounded by a bunch of other people, the high risk people, because we had smaller uh, caseloads that we could focus on them more heavily. Uh, then we pushed to ha uh, have successful clients discharged early. And when we discharged them early, we increased that fivefold when I was commissioner. Uh, we had the state evaluate the outcomes and the reconviction rates after one year for the people that got off early were lower than the ones who stayed on for their full terms. Again, this allowed us to reduce the unnecessary deprivation of liberty for those under supervision and focus resources more on those with higher risks and needs. A couple of other unintended side effects of the growth of probation are the growth of incarceration for technical non-criminal violations and racial disparities. People of color are supervised for longer and revoked more frequently than white people, even when you control for other factors like risk and current offense, um, uh, especially in this era of ra racial reconciliation, this demands attending to. Recent enactment of legislation in California to reduce probation terms to two years for a felony and one year for a misdemeanor should help you with this. So it's, a, it's kind of a nice time for you to be having this forum because it, it's really a, a terrific opportunity. Um, with the respect to the uh, contribution that community supervision makes to incarceration, uh, in 2017, research by the Council of State Government showed that one out of four people entering U.S. prisons were entering for technical parole or probation violations nationally. That cost $2.8 million. Uh, this is despite the fact that there's no clear evidence that incarceration for technical violations uh, helps improve public safety. So two quick examples 
should suffice here. In 1996, in 1996, there were 82,000 people on probation in New York City. Now there are 14,000 people on probation in New York City. It's about an 80 plus percent decline during that time. So remember the two purposes of probation, less crime, less incarceration. Despite the fact that when we, we withdrew 80% of our probation population, the jail population declined from 22,000 to 4,500. 4,500 people in an 8.6 million person city. And homicides dropped, crime overall dropped. Homicides dropped from 2,200 in the mid 90s to below 300 pre-pandemic. Closer to home here in California or there in California, you provide an excellent example how less can be more when it comes to community supervision. From 2007 to 2018, the number of people on probation and parole in California dropped by nearly 150,000 people, nearly a third. During that time, the state prison population also declined by 21%, 35,000 people. And statewide, arrests in California declined by 29% during that time. In both California and New York, resources were diverted that were being spent uh, to lock people up and to supervise people under uh, probation into communities. So New York, as our population declined by, I said, 80 plus percent, to be sure, our department took several budget cuts uh, amounting to a $24 million annual decline by the time I left office in uh, 2015. Um, but because our population had declined so much, we were actually spending twice as much per person under supervision as we did in the mid 90s. We used those funds to reduce caseloads for a high risk population and expand community programming. We opened up 14 neighborhood offices that we dubbed NEONs or neighborhood opportunity networks that feel more like a decent nonprofit organization. Some are actually co-located with nonprofits, three of them are at YMCA's. Uh, these included credible messengers like what Clinton and David just discussed, food banks that fed 12,000 people a week during the pandemic, not just people on probation, people in the neighborhoods they're in, arts programming, GED classes, workforce development, and tutoring among others. The opening of these NEONs has been especially good for our transition age youth whose recidivism rates dropped several fold as much as older adults, because in my view, they were treated with dignity and respect and offered access to programming instead of just a 10 minute conversation with their PO that they sometimes waited hours for. California's likewise reallocated hundreds of millions of dollars that were transferred to counties through measures like Prop 47, SB 678, AB 109 and others. I know those are not without controversy, but the fact that uh, the reallocation of resources has occurred, in my view, may help have helped contribute to the decline in crime in California experience during this time. As I said, right now, the fact that you have several new board members, you're about to have a change in leadership in a department, uh, you have this new legislation shortening terms, it offers seven, San Diego County numerous opportunities to be purposeful with your next steps. So I have a couple of recommendations and then I'll close. One is focus, focus, focus. One of the worst elements of the changes I described above is that all manner of people continue to be thrown at probation departments with severely limited resources and a society that frankly grown increasingly hostile towards their clientele. Probation officers often ensconced in risk averse environments were told to fix all these problems. With high caseloads and dwindling social services, it's not surprising that they over relied on the one resources that was infinitely available to them, jail. Research shows that resources of probation should be highly focused on those at highest risk in the beginning of their supervision and on the factors that will make the biggest difference toward their rehabilitation. So I suggest you put your low risk clients on bank caseloads as quickly as you can, perhaps after a month or two during which they receive social service referrals. Such caseloads can be monitored quarterly or monthly through an online reporting system, which can be two-way so clients can reach out if they need assistance. Similarly, if medium risk clients are in compliance for six to 12 months, depending on the severity of their crime, they can, should be able to earn their way to be on a banked caseload 
Um, this will prevent frivolous violations for non-criminal missteps and allow you to focus your staff and programmatic time on those with the highest risk, which is where you'll have the biggest bang for your buck. I also recommend that you all but eliminate standard conditions of probation and start with almost a blank or nearly blank sheet of paper when setting conditions, perhaps with only one or two standard conditions like obey all criminal laws and report to your probation officer. Other than that, the court, probation, prosecution, and defense should negotiate conditions that focus on a small number of factors that actually matter for the person's rehabilitation or that are demonstrably related to their offending. As anybody who's tried to quit smoking or lose weight can tell you, you don't wanna pick like eight behavior changes to focus on at once or 20, like many standard conditions require. Um, here's just one example of, of a condition that on its face sounds reasonable. Don't associate with anyone with a criminal record. Totally sounds reasonable. Around one in 12 black men in the United States is on probation or parole. I don't know what the numbers are in San Diego. And one in three men, black men, have a felony conviction on their record. So this condition, which seems reasonable on its face, can be unfeasible, puts your POs in a position of saying, uh-oh, this guy went to his cousin's house for Thanksgiving and his cousin's got a criminal record, what do I do? Uh, however, if me and a specific crime partner have a history of committing crimes together, perhaps a specific order that says I can't associate with him or her while I'm on probation is more tailored, more appropriate, and more reasonably enforceable. Finally, I suggest you create an upper level review process for every proposed technical violation into incarceration where line staff need to get supervisorial permission, and then pass violation requests through a review committee, which is enabled to make suggestions about different tactics to try prior to incarceration with final approval by a deputy chief. Deprivation of liberty for a non-criminal act should be treated very seriously and is reflected by this recommendation. This is an approach they took in Denver that's really focused revocations on those for whom it's appropriate. Two, become coaches, not referees. Brian Lovins is the incoming president of the American Probation and Parole Association and former assistant commissioner in Houston. He says that probation needs to return to the day when its staff are more focused on bolstering the assets and resiliencies of those under supervision rather than surveilling and violating them, what we in the field call trailing, nailing, and jailing. There's a lot to unpack here, but I'll mention a few items. Evidence-based approaches like motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy are designed specifically to help change criminal ways, thinking in ways that evidence shows people uh, reduce reoffending. Also, treating people under supervision, particularly transition aids youth who have heightened sense of fairness in, way that, in ways that bolster the system's legitimacy in their eyes, not only makes them feel better about the justice system, but helps them do better under supervision. I got two more recommendations. Am I doing okay on time? Yeah, you're doing okay. We'll get through the last two here. Great. Take care of the young ones. Uh, when I was commissioner in New York City, you know, we, we had risk assessments on everybody. We found that the young people under supervision, age 18 to 25, who scored low risk on our instrument were actually being rearrested at higher rates than those over age 25 who scored high risk. So low risk young guys were doing worse than high risk everybody else. Age was trumping risk. So we paid a lot of special attention to our transition age youth. And I believe you have special caseloads for them in San Diego. I think one mm -hmm. of the speakers coming up next will mention that. Uh, uh, the, they were especially receptive to the NEONS and to our ARCHES program that Clinton probably talked about uh, that paired formerly incarcerated people with mentoring and cognitive behavioral therapy. The ARCHES program was shown by Ur Urban Institute research to reduce reconviction rates for young people who participated in by 57% versus a matched group of youth on our caseload that did not have access to ARCHES. Um, and then finally, do it with and in the community. There's a strong research base from people like Harvard's Robert Sampson and NYU's Patrick Sharkey 
that more cohesive communities that have informal social controls have lower crime rates than demographically similar communities with fewer social controls. Sharkey found that every 10 additional nonprofit organizations devoted to community development or violence prevention in a city with 100,000 residents led to a 9% drop in the murder rate and a 6% drop in violent crime. Probation and parole in some respects have grown to take the place of informal social controls, particularly in heavily impacted communities. Um, and this is, I think, in, in some respects could, could have a negative impact uh, if, if probation and parole aren't careful. Um, this is an area where San Diego could really make its mark. I hear you talking about working closely with your communities. If you could do this at this watershed moment to co-design the employment, training, counseling, housing, mental health, and other supports and opportunities for those under probation supervision. With that kind of robust set of opportunities available, particularly in your high impact communities, I would suggest that your POs move their offices into those neighborhoods and co-locate mm -hmm. with well-respected community groups. The community and department can learn from one another, legitimize the notion that yes, People under supervision are and should be held accountable for their offenses, but in a way that maximizes their opportunities to become the kinds of neighbors we all want them to be. In so doing, the community becomes empowered to facilitate its own safety in a partnership with probation in a way that it used to when I was a kid before the advent of mass supervision and mass incarceration. So I'll stop there and uh, open it up to questions or whatever comes next. Thank you very much uh, for, for your presentation. Let me ask my, uh, my colleagues if they have uh, any questions or comments uh, for you. Uh, I don't have specific uh, questions, uh, Mr. Charlie. I just, I think um, I do wanna look into a little bit more of what you were saying about having, you know, meet the concept of meeting people where they are is sort of the philosophy that I had in my previous work that I've done at uh, Planned Parenthood. And, and I know it's uh, very effective, and I would love to look into that a little bit more as we're looking at um, the work and how we're developing, you know, all over the communities. But um, but I appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. We we just did some work with Lena Hidalgo, who's the essentially the chair of the uh, board in in Harris County, and and Henry Gonzalez, who's their chief juvenile probation officer and a bunch of people in their community. It was a sort of coordinated effort with community stakeholders and, and uh, legal system stakeholders. And Henry actually transferred several million dollars from his budget to the community. And I gotta tell you, Henry was not there when we started, but he really became a believer. He felt that the community was leaning into this conversation and uh, some of their ideas they came up with were not what his department would have come up with. And Lena, you know, she, she pushed the, the envelope with her fellow supervisors. They call them county judges, but they, they're not really judges. They're like you, you all are. And, uh, and they transferred money from Henry's budget into, a, into some small pot of, you know, several million dollars though, pot of community design programs. It's very interesting. There are, I, I think there are a lot of um, folk, community members, I think, right now that are informally doing this work without the resources um, to really support our communities because of the cultural, uh, I think, the competence piece, the understanding community, and really trying to build at a different level. So I, I'm really, um, I'll, I'll be looking more into this. So I really appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shirley, I want to thank you for your time. We spent a lot of time on juvenile, and I think a lot of your suggestions around adult are uh, are really important. Oh, before we go, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chair Fletcher. I, these are really, really helpful and really interesting um, uh, policy suggestions. I think my my question is much more big picture. Um, so, sort of stepping back, how much of these what when you think about making these kinds of pivots, these uh, pivots that are would require action at the board level or is this um you know are we really looking you know probate uh, process of hiring a new probation chief uh someone who would come in and make it you know within probation you know in other words are these policy changes from the board or are these sort of policy changes that can be driven internal to probation and probation yeah i don't i don't think that, that they require legislation um 
I don't know how your budgeting process works. I mean, my boss, when, when I was commissioner with Mayor Bloomberg, it wasn't, it wasn't the board because we had a mayoral form of government. And, um, uh, and so I was able to move my money within my budget to open the neons, for example, you know, 14 offices, that wasn't nothing. Uh, by downsizing some of my other offices and, uh, you know, fortunately where all my offices were, were centralized and centralized office space in New York City is extremely expensive, whereas office space in Brownsville was a lot cheaper I'm the South Bronx. So I was able to do that all within my budget, but I always, you know, I always kept my oversight chair informed of what we were doing. She came, cut the ribbon at several uh, of the office openings. Whenever we opened an office, we always did it in collaboration with and with the permission of that city council member. So we opened 14, one city council member said no, so we just didn't open one in his neighborhood. Uh, I think later he wished we had. Um, and they became more than just places for probation, by the way. People in the neighborhood came in. We had a GED class. It was open to everybody. We had turkey giveaways. We had health fairs. We had poetry. My South Bronx Neon still has a poet in residence. And community members, as well as people on probation, as well as probation staff, do poetry readings and publish a poetry book every quarter. They did not like this at first. My, my staff thought it was touchy feely garbage and they did not want to go into Brownsville and East New York and Harlem. They were afraid because mm -hmm. it was a little more dangerous than where their centralized offices were. But over time, actually, uh, those became the more desirable spots for staff because they were doing such cool stuff with the communities and staff very instinctively got that they because they were themselves you know they were coaches and they went to church and they this was very instinctive that all of a sudden now the commissioner has given me permission to do the kinds of things that really kind of feel sensible and so we had leagues of basketball leagues with the kids and we had you know putting up murals and we could put up I think seven murals on Pitkin Avenue in Brownsville and everybody was proud about those murals. So it, it, really, it really had a tremendous impact on mm -hmm. staff, although they were definitely nervous about it at first. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And that again, you know, that's a recurring theme, right? Throughout the day is, is anytime you're trying to change something, uh, there will be skepticism, there will be kind of some pushback. That's kind of not the way we do it. Uh, but, you know, one of the advantages we have is we can learn from a lot of these places that did it and replicate something that we can point to and say, we know this works. Uh, it may not feel like what we've always done, uh, but the goal is, is safer communities and thriving folks. And, and, and so if there's a, a better way to, to get to that point, um, then, you know, we got to be willing to embrace things, even if it seems a little unconventional or uh, outside the traditional way of thinking. So I, I think those are wonderful uh, examples for us to learn from. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Thank you for all of your work, your research. I know I've reviewed a lot of what you've done, and it is very informative to uh, to what we are trying to do here. And so we're, we're very grateful for your time and effort and energy. Thank you all for having me. Take care now. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, we are going to uh, shift to a little focus on research and implementation. Uh, Tommy Baines, Director, Los Angeles County Probation, will present the LA County Probation Invest Program. Uh, this is a very innovative program in partnership with LA County Probation, uh, LA County Department of Health Services, uh, their Office of Diversion and Reentry and Workforce uh, that really talks about providing employment, housing, wraparound services. Again, we're still on adults uh, to adults on probation who have been assessed as a medium to high risk uh, of reoffending. Tommy, we greatly appreciate you, Mr. Baines, uh, making some uh, some time to uh, to share with our county. Uh, some uh, some great work you all have, have, have done, and I would like to uh, turn 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 the presentation over to you at this point. Oh, there you go. Very happy to be here with you all today. I've been um, listening to the uh, amazing uh, developments. I've been with probation since the early 90s um, and been in service to public since uh, 1984. 
So I'm thrilled to see the direction um, that we've moved toward. And uh, I want to thank the board for having me here. I'm humbled to be here with David and, and Clinton and, and um, the folks who have presented already. And so uh, I want to tell you about our program. Um, <clears throat> but I want to say that I came to probation originally after uh, years as a social worker. And I used to refer to myself as a, a social worker who works for the probation department. Um, because at the time, I felt that distinction was important. And I'm really pleased to say that I feel like we're moving to a time where I don't need to make that distinction. <clears throat> so um, I was a, this program, the INVEST program, is a, uh, the Innovative Employment Solutions Program. It was created in 2017 to effectively align and leverage county resources and partnerships to improve employment opportunities and resources for adult probationers in Los Angeles County. Um, <clears throat> It's a five-year pilot program. We're in year four. Um, and at this time, uh, the way the program is structured, my deputies are co-located in AJCC uh, locations. That is American Job Centers of California, formerly uh, unemployment offices, as, as for some of us who remember that. <clears throat> and those locations, we do, we have um, a, we work with um, workforce development, aging, and communities. And in those locations, they have a case manager and a business services representative who provide employment-related assistance and training, along with um, <clears throat> support services that are curated by the Office of Diversion and Reentry through some of their contracts. So focus on job readiness, uh, resume and interview prep, uh, and then, of course, the most uh, challenging piece, which is uh, they work with um, business service representatives and job developers to um, find placements and employment opportunities. So there are three uh, principles that I've uh, insisted that we operate on, and that is uh, to make these the uh, places where we're co-located, uh, places where our clients feel like that it's a safe space for them, uh, and there are three things. <clears throat> One, that, we, that our clients are treated with respect um, in sort of consciousness and awareness of um, the trauma that folks have encountered, uh, the, sometimes the unpleasant experiences they've had with law enforcement. And, um, and then they, they're allowed to retain their dignity and their sense of self-determination. So we do individualized assessments. People are not shoehorned into a particular program or training alternative. And then in addition to that, um, I, you know, we ask that our staff in all three agencies, uh, management, that we're aspirational on their behalf because that's a really powerful element that uh, and a way of supporting people where you come alongside them uh, we do very engagement-oriented uh, outreach, and, uh, and, and we do that together with the folks. That's one thing that probation has not traditionally been really open um, in terms of our, our offices and places that we work. And we have uh, brought the business service, the case manager, and the business service representatives to our offices so that we can execute warm handoffs. Because it's a very different thing to give a person a referral and say, hey, go to this place, than to say to people, hey, this is my friend who takes really good care of people who are in your situation. And uh, they're going to help you. And both of us will meet you over there at the, uh, at the Re WorkSource Center next week on Tuesday. And so we found that that <clears throat> has resulted in a much higher rate of, um, so if you have good programming and you have a good opportunity, first people have to know about it. And then second, uh, what we found is that, how do you make sure that you're actually connecting them? So there's the difference between referring people and connecting people to opportunities. And when you're connecting people to opportunities, you rely a lot of times on transferred trust. So you, you build relationship with your clients and then you say, you know what, I can see that you can do these things if you're given the right opportunity. I know a place where they have them and I want you to meet this person who's gonna provide that for you. And so the handoff is a human experience that we all do with our children when we take them to school and we hand, uh, or we take them to places where we're taking the people that we trust to take good care of them. And so that's the, uh, 
the, the last piece is that we all want to be aspirational on behalf of our clients. So that last piece for, for um, and it's interesting how our, the roles grow from there. Because then you have, how do you get, uh, most clients will say to you, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, nobody will hire me because I have a felony on my record. And so the truth of the matter is that's not true, but no one's really made much of an effort to dispel that uh, myth. And so uh, we had, we've engaged in our county in a fair chance campaign and employer outreach um, that's conducted by our business service representatives and by um, our workforce and ec economic development team over at WEDEX. And those representatives are uh, make the effort to identify and connect participants to second chance friendly employment opportunities, of which there are quite a few. <clears throat> and the result of that has been that since January 2018, when the program sort of finished uh, startup activities, we've had well over 3,000 referrals, um, over 1,350 uh, enrollments, and over 700 folks have gotten unsubsidized and or, transi and or transitional jobs. Um, all program staff uh, participate in a, a training, which is out of um, Pennsylvania and National Institute of Corrections, uh, originally uh, called the Offender Workforce Development Services because it's out of corrections. We adapted the training, but um, dropped the name um, so that our clients are not triggered and we call it inclusive workforce development training. And um, they provide assessments, uh, some cognitive behavioral intervention, and then the individualized career planning <clears throat> with employment acquisition assistance. So what I wanted to do is share with you um, briefly three stories um, of clients who had uh, the experience they had with us and what we feel like was brought to them by their engagement in the program. Uh, the first one um, is, is Tom. Tom hadn't had steady employment for over five years after being released from custody. Um, that's not uncommon for people that once they fall out of the, out of the workforce to stay out and, and sort of be discouraged and um, feel like the barriers are too much to overcome. So he came to, he signed up, which is a huge act of trust. Um, and then he attended an eight week heavy operator, a heavy equipment operator training. He completed the course, his record was great. His scores were all above average. And he was, uh, and he received their student of the month award during his graduation ceremony. Um, he, the support he was able to get at the American Job Center included, and through the invest team, uh, providing him with work and interview clothing, uh, tools, and transportation support. And with a couple of days uh, after graduation, he was interviewed and, and secured a full-time position as a heavy equipment operator, earning $22 an hour. And so I, I always feel like his story... Um, depicts the value of support and aspirational engagement. So when someone, you may feel, some of our clients really feel like they're discouraged and that they, they don't see a lot of hope and someone, uh, someone else saying, no, there's something else you can do, you know, we'll, we'll show you how to do it. I, you know, here's some of the options. And that energy uh, is sort of like an injection. And sometimes it gets people moving and they can be, they have an opportunity to be successful in ways they didn't anticipate. Um, <clears throat> so Frederick and, John, and uh, Jason's story are two gentlemen who um, were having a hard time finding employment. They came in together. They had a hard time finding employment due to their justice involvement and their background. And uh, once they were enrolled, um, they participated in a carpentry training cohort um, and became uh, eligible for carpentry apprenticeships. Uh, when they completed the program, their story is interesting because they were offered a really unique opportunity to do an apprenticeship in Japan. So the obvious problem that arises with something like that is that, you know, that requires you to leave the country. Most people have probation condi conditions that would prohibit that kind of movement. And so we um, 
our deputies wrote reports and went in to ask for court hearings and asked for permission for them to leave the, the country. And we also were able to set, um, to bring in the employer who also vouched for them. And they were allowed to leave the country, participate in the apprenticeship position in Saipan, Japan, uh, where they were paid $32 an hour, and they, which included expenses for room and board and meal stipends. So that one, and with the help of that um, support from our team, there was some, they were able to not only obtain the position, but get credit hours for the union membership and access to a sustainable living wage. So that one is a, a reflection of what we find often that comes up where there's a barrier and unless someone acts on their behalf as an advocate, the, the barrier to their uh, access to employment um, will prohibit them from, from proceeding. And in this case, we were able to, to um, reduce, eliminate that barrier, and they were able to uh, access that really unique opportunity. <clears throat> so the last one is um, Javier. Javier was uh, originally worked in the medical field, um, had a, a, uh, an arrest related to substance abuse, and the record, the nature of that record prevented him from um, getting employment in his previous capacity as a, as a licensed CNA or certified CNA. And so, um, so here's a guy who makes a mistake and the, this career that he had worked in for many years is no longer available to him because he no longer meets certification requirements. And he had been out for several years um, and, it had, and it looked like um, in talking to him that he had decided, you know, that was it. Like he had blown the opportunity he had and he didn't have another chance. Um, he, our team assisted him with career planning, resume development, interview prep, employment leads, trans transportation support, interview clothing. And in his case, probably the most important thing was emotional support and coaching. And uh, he worked closely with his team. He never missed an appointment. And he believed them when they said this can happen. And he, I was there the day that he got the word that he had been um, hired as a property manager and to manage several properties. And it was a really um, moving experience to, uh, to, to hear him talk about how he didn't really, some part of him didn't believe that was possible. And so <clears throat> I've, <clears throat> I've come to think of our program as building um, sort of a transformational highway with different on-ramps for different folks and access to it. Um, we, the things that have contributed to that success, success the most, I think, has been the um, collaborative, uh, the effort to operationalize collaboration so that we get beyond, uh, this is an interdepartmental program, and so we get beyond <clears throat> just going to the same meetings uh, and being cordial, but not actually figuring out exactly how we're going to work together to get the kind of results that we're hoping for. And so um, we put together a leadership um, a work a leadership uh, work group, and we meet twice a month. And we it's a data driven, data focused meeting where we look at the data from different locations. We look at workflow. We look at in, um, the rate of um, referrals to enrollments. And then if we see something is going well in one location, we ask how we can extend that to other locations. And that has allowed us to be during the implementation process, instead of waiting at the end, getting an evaluation, and they say, well, that, was, that wasn't, you know, we just wasted that $25 million. Um, that has allowed us to make timely um, adaptations to our program, one of which has included um, reducing the number of POs in each location, but increasing the number of locations, which improves access and sort of lowers the law enforcement footprint in those locations. And that has proven to make the space more appealing and broader uh, range of folks seem to be comfortable. And that was all also part of the, you know, in talking to clients and talking to folks who are it, from the justice involved community, and folks who are returning and re-entry and sitting down and 
asking them like, what works for you? We shortened the, we uh, started focus on shorter training and I have access to apprenticeships because so many of our clients have urgent needs. Uh, we found that over 12% of our client of our client base self-reported as homeless. So food insecurity, transportate, lack of transportation access, uh, housing insecurity are all features um, that would driving decision like can I participate in a in a uh, employment training program. Um, and so we had to make some adaptations to really focus on those on the job training and transitional employments that can transition to full-time uh, sub unsubsidized employment. And uh, last but not least, I think I would, I'd like to say, I think there's two major victories that I'd like to share. One, um, the California Work Source Association um, and the Prison to Employment Programming that they, they, they uh, dispersed here in the California, uh, in the state. In our county, uh, they did stakeholder reviews and our uh, program was um, highlighted by folks in the community as as the an example as what they would like to see done. And so we were heavily involved in both design and coordination efforts for the development of the uh, prison to employment program here in the Los Angeles County area with all seven workforce uh, investment boards. And uh, I think the last one is that we have been part of working with folks where uh, public agencies are in this way putting their money where their mouth is. They're taking a look at whether there's a nexus between employment requirements and, um, you know, do we need to say that folks cannot work in certain departments, for example. So Los Angeles County and the city of Los Angeles, we had two gentlemen on active probation supervision who had a felony, a record of a felony on their record who were hired by Los Angeles County in permanent full-time employment in parks and rec and also in um, beaches and harbors. And that's really important because LA County is the largest employer in Los Angeles County. So in that way, that's so the, the effort to make sure that there are access to um, these employment opportunities includes taking a look at are we, are we creating barriers where they don't need to exist? So thank you so much for your time. I hope, um, I hope it's been helpful to you. Yeah, Mr. Baines, that was very, very informative and I think very helpful to, to really see a, a case study and a success story and something I think we can learn from as a county tremendously. Uh, let me ask my colleagues if they have any comments or, or questions. Nope. One question. Oh, go ahead, whoever. No, 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 thank you. I'm taking a lot of notes down, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Did, uh, Mr. Baines, did you um, have any pitfalls or kind of lessons learned about uh, co-locating with other departments or services? Was there any challenges in that or anything um, we should kind of take to heart? I think, um, I think what we learned most is that uh, co-location was a recommended methodology. Um, I think you have to have I think what we did best was create a work group so we could have honest conversations um, between our respective agencies. Because during those honest conversations, we it was revealed um, that folks, you know, we get comfortable working with our client base and then we think, of course, other people will be, but other people haven't worked with them before. So stigma, um, sort of some anxiety, trepidation, and so it's pretty easy for you to get the idea that when you go somewhere that you're not wanted. And our clients are particularly sensitive to that. And so we had to build in into our work um, a real sense of teamwork and, and the fact that we're there to support the people who are gonna be providing the services. So we're working with them together. We're not saying here, we wanna take this client um, and give them to you and it's your responsibility to deal with all the issues that they have. And once we kind of push through that, um, you know, the sort of, I think with sort of natural trepidation about working with folks that you uh, are not aware that you've been working with, I always say they, they already were in the work source centers, people, they were just unidentified. And so because they were unidentified, we weren't spe uh, specifically addressing those needs. Um, <clears throat> 
there is, WIOA has some requirements for, uh, I think probably one of the biggest ones was that WIOA has some requirements if you share space, they want you to share expenses. And the amount, the formula for that is curious. Um, and, and, uh, and it's also not completely within the uh, uh, purview of, of, the, uh, of the workforce boards to control. Like it's sort of set out by California Workforce Association. So it's, that one's a little trickier, um, but we have kind of made a rule to uh, not down, turn down any allies uh, in this fight because it's more, it's bigger than what we're trying to do. Um, and we all have, there's a uh, necessary contribution from everyone. And we found by working together and having those honest conversations that the folks of workforce have really, they really have something to offer in this, uh, in this effort to change how we, for one, they have the AJCC locations, which in Los Angeles, there's 62 of them and 33 of them are in LA city proper, but they are in unique neighborhoods and that area is already there. So when you are looking for how you have community-based services, those, those areas, what we've tried to do is make them a hub and to do capacity building in those locations alongside them. Got it. No, thank you. That's super, super helpful. Um, thank you, Mr. Baines. We're very grateful for your time uh, and, and your work. And it, it, I think it serves to inform us wonderfully about what we're doing. And, and we're grateful for you taking the time uh, to, uh, to share all this with you and joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to hear uh, from Cesar Escuro, our interim chief probation officer, who will uh, present on upcoming enhancements in the adult system around case planning, as well as barriers adults on probation are facing, uh, focused on mental health and substance abuse issues transforming probation services in the community uh, and designing specialty services for transition age youth uh, who are, uh, are on probation. And so, uh, Cesar, we want to uh, turn it over to you and appreciate the work you're doing and uh, your presentation today. Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. And thanks to Mr. Sheraldi and Mr. Baines. Although it's been quite some time and many years since we've spoken, it's great to see you even virtually. You all have had powerful messages on justice reform, where we've been and where we need to go. As your interim chief, I'm excited to share with you some of the current work that we are doing in adult probation, but also share with you areas that we still need focus and attention. Adult probation in California operates at the end of the justice system. Probation starts after an arrest is made by law enforcement and after a conviction is handed down by the adult court. Clients are referred to us by the court after a conviction, or we receive clients after they have completed their jail or prison term. The purpose of adult probation is to focus on the client's rehabilitation and reentry goals while they remain in the community closest to home. There are three types of probation supervision. Formal probation is an alternative to local jail for certain felonies and misdemeanors. Supervision can also be in addition to a jail sentence. Post-release community supervision follows an individual's release from state prison following certain felony crimes. The third supervision type is mandatory supervision. For certain felonies, individuals can receive a split sentence with a portion of the sentence served in a community under probation supervision. Currently, we have approximately 9,400 adults supervised in San Diego, which is a 12% decrease over the last four years. The probation is 81% males, 19% females. Our current ethnic breakdown of clients supervised is 3% Asian, 16% Black, 38% White, 39% Hispanic, and 4% Other. Historically, adult probation has been primarily focused on reducing future crime. Research demonstrates that by focusing supervision and services on adults most likely to continue committing crimes, actually reduces or prevents the most future crimes. Providing more supervision to adults who are high risk to commit crimes means providing structure and services to address the root causes of someone's criminal behavior. By using motivational interviewing techniques to better understand their experiences and motivations for change, coupled with having frequent check-ins to encourage behavior change, 
we can make our, sure our clients stay engaged with services and are progressing positively. At the local level, to do our work successfully, we jointly develop case plans with our high-risk clients. Comprehensive case plans are the foundation for high-risk probation clients receiving services and supports they need, and also in identifying gaps they may have in housing, education, and employment. During the probation investigation process, each client is given a risk assessment to determine their risk for reoffending, their needs, and to determine the level of supervision they will need. Probation uses a validated risks and needs assessment tool called the COMPASS to assess our clients' risks and needs. As we heard earlier, the field of probation is not static. We must always review national best practices and our own internal practices so that we can ensure our case plans are comprehensive, individualized, and manageable for each of our clients. We must identify the services and supports our client needs. And moving forward, we need to continue adopting the role of connector and support in helping our clients receive these services. We must also constantly follow up with our clients to ensure that the services that we've identified are available, accessible, and meet their needs. We must also continue to ensure that our staff are trained in developing educational and individualized case plans and in successfully utilizing motivational interviewing techniques. Our staff must also have the connections to the resources at their fingertips. One tool we use is the Community Resource Directory. The Community Resource Directory is an internal probation database of community-based programs and services. We have learned that resources and services come and go in the communities and we have to have dedicated support staff update and review the directory periodically to support our staff in supporting clients. We must ramp up our efforts in evaluating community-based programs and services listed in the directory to ensure they have fidelity to evidence-based practices so we can continue to support positive outcomes for our clients. As we refine the role of adult probation, to one of support and connector, we must also invest in our staff, all our staff, both sworn and professional, the backbone of our department, and provide education and training to staff on how to improve client engagement and communication between client and staff. And as the same way, to amplify our staff's personal growth and to continue to enhance their personal development and competency. Our job is to support our clients where they are and within the support systems they are connected to. Our clients may have needs that are outside the normal scope of probation, but as a connector, we can link them to other state and county services so that they can be successful. As Mr. Sharadi mentioned, there have been many changes in California law. In 2011, AB 109 transferred supervision populations and responsibilities from the state to the counties. And then we have AB 1950, which earlier this year limits the times adults can be on probation. With, with changes in laws, it is paramount that we continually review and when necessary, restructure caseloads and activities to address emerging risks and needs. With the implementation of AB 1950, to reduce length of probation, it is imperative that we quickly identify the most pressing needs of our clients and ensure they can access services in the new shorter time frame. As a department, we're also committed to enhancing and strengthening our diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are committed to identify and address practices that are influenced by implicit and structural biases to ensure we have equity, access, and inclusion in our services and practices for our clients, the community, and our staff. We will continue conducting our listening sessions each quarter with line staff, supervisors, and probation leadership. We will also continue our relationship with the community to work together to hear concerns and search for real and tangible solutions. We will continue to invest in our staff to provide more targeted trainings that support our staff's understanding 
knowledge on social justice issues and concerns. <clears throat> I would now like to spend a few minutes sharing with you some of the barriers our clients face. Research demonstrates that there are multiple barriers experienced by adults on community supervision. They include housing, education, and employment. Without housing, it's hard to attend higher education. Yet without education, it's hard to find a job. They are all intertwined. As we all know, affordable housing is a challenge in San Diego County, and especially challenging for adults with a criminal history. One area that we would like to focus on this coming year is to build partnerships with local housing authorities, large apartment owners, and transition living providers so that we can expand and strengthen the availability of housing options. One national best practice we would like to explore are housing navigators. These housing navigators would be co-located at a regional office and would allow a designated housing expert to assist clients with housing services and the help they need to navigate the complexities around securing and maintaining suitable housing. Another barrier is education. Many of our clients have limited success in formal education and often need to be connected with adult education or our community college systems. They need help in navigating enrollment, learning how to be college ready, and thereafter, how to be successful in college. We all know that limited education is a barrier to seeking and securing employment, as well as career advancement. It is important that our clients access to many high quality education opportunities and career education programs that are offered in our county. We need to partner with our adult education and community college systems to keep our clients and gain the education and skills they need to be successful in their lives. And finally, our clients face barriers to employment. Candidly, connections to employment are a significant gap in adult probation. We frequently talk to our clients about finding and keeping a job but we need to better understand the employment and training resources available for our clients. We must explore how employment navigators can build partnerships with local employment enterprises, such as the Workforce Partnership, trade industries, and employment training opportunities. These can include opportunities for internships and apprenticeships. We recognize it is a priority for our clients to be self-sufficient. It does not help to our clients to just say, you need to find a job, when it is difficult for some clients to even begin, and as Mr. Bain says, because they've been out of the workforce for so long. What they may need is training for a career with a livable wage. And as Mr. Bain said, we can no longer, it's, that can't be good enough to just tell a, a client, go find a job. We need to connect them. Our clients also face mental health and substance abuse issues. The probation department is committed to strengthening our partnership with behavioral health services to connect our adult clients to needed care and support. We want to expand our agreement with behavioral health services to outstation clinicians at our regional offices who will be available to immediately work with clients that need clinical services. These clinicians will play a vital role in our multidisciplinary teams who focus on individual needs of clients. We hope to explore further partnership with BHS to identify national best practices in areas such as joint case planning and joint case management for high need clients. Also training staff on effective mental health and substance abuse interventions. Additionally, training on how to identify common mental health and substance abuse warning signs so we may offer support to our clients at the earliest possible opportunity. In the next six months, um, probation officers work to preserve community safety to promote rehabilitation. Our department is committed to achieving these goals by reducing reliance on sanctions and incarceration, balanced by increased support to our clients in meeting their individual needs. Adult probation will work with the court in developing incentivized supervision practices, such as recommending terminating probation early 
for those who are meeting their goals and demonstrating safe behavior in the community. When individuals have challenges, we will continue to increase the use of graduated sanctions, including immediate referrals to treatment and detox beds, with custody being the least desirable option. As we deliver services, our department sees an immense value to our clients in replicating the one-stop shop. That's similar to the neighborhood opportunity mall that was just um, referenced by our speakers. That's in New York. The Invest model and anti-recidivism coalition model, both in Los Angeles, where housing, education, and employment services can be available in one place. In the NEON model, New York City probation placed their offices in communities where clients lived and where they needed a larger array of services. Their probation staff are co-located with their partners in behavioral health services and housing and employment services. These services are not just available for the justice-involved population, but rather the entire community in an effort to bring government to all residents and increase services. We are committed to modeling the NEON concept to our clients at the new Mid-City Hub in North Park. This co-location space will open at the end of 2021. We are also partnering with the Health and Human Services Agency to serve clients in the, in the Lemon Grove Family Resource Center, as well as in the future Southeastern Livewell Center. These buildings are designed with the client consumer in mind, welcoming entries, comfortable seating, in locations we're closest to where the clients live. We are seeking to co-locate probation staff with other services and make space available for community-based organizations. Many of our clients need more than one rehabilitative or supportive services, so co-location saves time for our clients and creates efficiencies. The last area I would like to briefly mention <clears throat> is addressing the needs of our transitional age youth or TAY population. Those young adults ages 18 to 24 who are in the adult probation system. Now this population has been historically mixed with older adults in programming, housing, and supervision. Research demonstrates that this population needs distinctive supervision and additional services and care to help them get back on, tra on track and away from deeper entrenchment into the criminal justice system. Recognizing the science behind adult brain development, we, must, we know that young adults struggle with critical thinking, consequence management, and proper decision making. We need to build a different probation or supervision model for this population. I am looking forward to this supervision concept and idea. And I wish I could say it was my idea but it wasn't my idea. This was an idea that was discussed and developed through collaboration. An idea that I'm proud to say was talked about for many months by probation staff, county staff, and most important, the community. We listened to each other, we educated one another, and we worked together in hopes to make a better community. Truly a team effort. With that as our foundation, the department is evaluating the feasibility of creating a special TAY caseload. And again, investing on our staff and staff training that will be built on stages of development, cognitive behavioral therapy, positive youth development, restorative practices, and other nationally recognized evidence-based training for that specific population. Focusing and developing special case votes for this population presents a unique opportunity for youth and adult probation to work together, especially as the department plans for the closing of the state's division of juvenile justice that was mentioned earlier. Developing these unique supports and supervision approaches for these young adults ages 18 to 24 can drastically change the life path and trajectory of these young adults and consequently our entire community. Our department is committed to leading the needed policy changes and allocating resources accordingly to meet the many needs and ideas you all have heard today 
we look forward to working with the board on our changes for the future of the probation department. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Caesar. Thank you for uh, for all of the work and, and everything uh, that, that you were doing as you see us through this interim process. We're grateful for it. Uh, just real quick, quick question. Have you thought about hiring uh, former justice involved individuals uh, to provincially provide some of these navigation services uh, that you mentioned, whether it's navigations to housing or employment or other 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 types of things? Chair Fletcher, that would be an outstanding idea. We've all I have already hired some former uh, probation clients, or they're now probation officers. So in the same vein, I think that would be an outstanding idea. Yeah, just seems like it, it can really help, uh, you know, a lot of these folks see that, hey, there is a better path out with someone who's had kind of lived experience and has, has managed to, to, to come through what they went through. So that, that's something I, I think is, is, is great. Uh, let me ask my colleagues if they have any questions for you. Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. This, uh, uh, Mr. Escuro, thank you so much for your presentation and all the great work that all of you are doing. Um, I think as per our conversation, I really do want to, as a former um, trustee for our community college, as I mentioned to you, I'm really interested uh, in, in um, identifying opportunities for us to really create that transition. Um, I know that there are models um, in Los Angeles and other areas that have worked and have been very successful uh, to help our students, um, you know, transition in and get their degrees and go on to community colleges. And I know, um, might be some folks who are also listening in today that um, have had a lot of experience. So I think uh, whatever I can do to support in that process, I would uh, you know, greatly appreciate the opportunity. I also learned uh, not too long ago um, from our libraries that you could actually get an AA through our library uh, education program. And so it might be a great partnership to have with our county libraries so that we are able to provide that opportunity for some of our students as we are moving forward. So. Um, I really like uh, the, the um, layout of the vision that you're talking about, and, and I'm looking forward uh, to working with our next probation officer to include um, these opportunities, including uh, working with the trades and some of the other programs that are available as well. So thank you again for uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, board member comments? All right, Caesar, we appreciate uh, appreciate your work. Uh, we're now going to move into uh, uh, two presentations um, from our labor union representatives uh, who represent the workers uh, in our probation system. Uh, and then following these two, uh, we will hear from public comment uh, individuals who have called in to, uh, to share their thoughts. I want to start with the president uh, of our Probation Officers Association, uh, Scott Lauder. Uh, I believe him and perhaps a colleague uh, are, uh, are, are with us on the line to uh, talk a little bit about what they see and, and what's going on and, and very important for us as a board uh, to keep the top of mind that the thoughts of our, of our probation workers who are out uh, being tasked to handle all of these changes and new directions and shifting things. Uh, and we greatly appreciate them and appreciate their work as, as we work through all these issues together. So let me uh, ask the clerk, uh, I think we can, I think we have Scott on the line. We can turn it over to uh, Scott first. And then uh, after that, I know we have two representatives from SEIU, uh, Juan Carlos and Alicia. Uh, we will go to after we hear from Scott and his folks. Thank you, Chair Fletcher, for those individuals that requested to speak in this item from the, the groups that uh, the chair mentioned. If you could please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. And uh, we'll begin with the two individuals that the chair mentioned. You'll need to press star six to unmute your line. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, before you start, I think we actually have three uh, union representatives of POA, the SPOA, and SEIU. Uh, and we will, uh, we will just go in that order. Great, thank you. So we'll begin with Hello. 2799. Hello. 2799, you, you may proceed. Hello. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Good morning, Chairman Fletcher, Vice Chair Vargas, Supervisor Anderson, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for holding this meeting. As the probation department continues to endure a number of changes and challenges, it is critical to have this sort of focused discussion. Thank you not only for taking the time to understand the probation department better, but also to hear the plan for the department moving into the future. You just heard a lot of information about the current action plan and proposed new direction for San Diego County probation. 
But all of this requires a leader that is focused in vision and ability to understand the complexity that apartment that our probation department makes it so unique. I'd like to note that the appointment of Cesar Escuro as our interim chief has proven to be an excellent decision. As a probation officer himself, Chief Escuro understands the nuances and complexities of our department and the daily challenges each officer must face. Accordingly, he has a unique and important understanding of our department in the chief's office. Our officers and our clients are far better served as a result. It's our hope that the Board of Supervisors recognizes the success and makes a commitment to ensure that our future probation chief also has experience as a frontline probation officer. As more and more changes are required of the probation moving forward, it is vital that we have the leadership and understanding of our department in a way that allows them to adequately and accurately communicate with you, with you exactly what our department needs. Without, sig without significant or correctly targeted resources, our department will be unable to fulfill the vision you have set forth, and we will be unable to truly provide the rehabilitative services these individuals require. As you are likely aware, the probation department has experienced a number of significant cuts over the years, financial reductions, staff reductions, resource reductions, while we recognize that some of these changes reflect a new vision for probation, we also recognize that any department will have a limit of to what cuts it can absorb. And I believe that the probation department has reached that limit, if not already exceeded it. So I would like to ask the board to put a halt to the trend of budget reductions and invest in a department that has the ability to have a significant impact on reducing those who have been involved in the justice system. While it's possible that you may have seen data showing our case and client numbers have declined over the recent years, some of these numbers may be misleading. Due to COVID-19 impacts on our court system and a number of cases that have been backlogged, once we return to normal operations, we anticipate a significant uptick in, in the exasperation of recent laws and, and jail closures that will increase the number of individuals who will be released into our care sooner than originally planned. We need to be prepared for this budget and budget accordingly. Probation is a complex department of numbers and moving parts and responsibilities. The data you receive from the Business Intelligence Unit is capable of telling you only one part of the story. Numbers also do not have the ability to address the proper caseloads to connect a client to adequate resources so that they do not continue to be part of the judicial system. It's important to dig deeper and ask questions to determine if the quantitative data truly matches the reality. Data provides one perspective, but we hope that you will gather information from our frontline officers and department leaders as well. Meanwhile, in terms of specific and immediate challenges, the impact of AB 1950 looms on the immediate horizon. This new law reduces the amount of time an individual can be on probation, which will increase the intensity level of the resources we must provide in order to truly ensure our clients have been rehabilitated. In other words, an officer has to do the same level of work in only two years that historically took three. Each case will place extra pressure on our officers to support our clients and ensure that they don't re-enter the criminal justice system again in the future. We will continue to support the goals outlined in the Georgetown study, but doing so, we will require the department to adequately be staffed and properly funded to carry out the priorities with appropriate programming and resources. We believe in the division the county we believe in the vision the county has set for the probation, but it must be implemented in a manner that treats our officers as true partners. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is 2934. 2934. Uh, good afternoon. Hi there. Okay. <laughs> My name is uh, Rich Tracta. I'm currently the president of the Supervising Probation Officers Association, the SPOA. And I'm going to represent the association board and its members. Um, first, I would like to also thank the board of supervisors for the opportunity to speak and be part of the process. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief, and I just have a, a few general comments. Um, first off, we wanted the board uh, to know that the SPOA is committed to assisting in any way we can and would like to continue to be a partner 
with the department in developing and shaping the future of probation in San Diego County. Uh, like the POA, uh, like Mr. Laudner had just stated, we too are concerned with the reduction in budget uh, over the last uh, couple of years, and this has in turn made us prioritize um, what we need to do with the department and uh, funding for any kind of programs. And as such, we want to uh, kind of piggyback on what Mr. Laudner said, and we would like to see these budget cuts halt so that we can continue to progress as a department. Uh, we do believe the department has been and is moving in the right direction as far as justice reform goes, but we also know that this is a long process. Uh, and as an association, we would like to have further discussions with the Board of Supervisors on how we can uh, continue to collaborate with the board, the other associations involved, and the department's executive team on reshaping how we do things. Uh, we look forward to working with the next chief PO uh, and continuing a positive relationship uh, that we have built over the years with the last uh, two chiefs. Um, as supervisors, we are charged with implementing not just programs, policies, and procedures, but also philosophies within the department. And as such, our members play a pretty significant role in the success of any type of implementation effort. We'd like to encourage using, continue to use internal subject matter experts as well as external subject matter experts, which we have heard from this morning, uh, in the process and believe that this is an important step for success. We too believe in the goal of building safer communities and would like to assist in whichever, whatever way we can, but knowing uh, budget constraints are going to hinder the process uh, and unless we can uh, move forward by uh, stopping these cuts. Um, I'm gonna close by just reiterating that, that we are wanting to continue that collaboration effort with both the executive team, with uh, the other associations, and also with the Board of Supervisors, and we uh, look forward to working with whoever chosen as our new chief. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 6020. 6020, and I believe we may have a couple people joining from that number. Hi, my name is Alicia Shirley, and I have been with the county for 10 years as a supervising office assistant. I'm joined today with my colleague, Juan Carlos Davenport. Good day to you. My name is Juan Carlos Davenport, and I have been with the county for six years, serving as a records clerk. Thank you for having us here today to represent our coworkers and our union, SEIU Local 221. We have already seen a positive shift within the department, which was started by our former chief probation officer, is carried on now by the interim chief and will hopefully be realized by our next leader. By moving towards a trauma-informed approach for both adult and youth probation, we can better serve our community in ways that are restorative rather than punitive. There are some concrete changes that can be made immediately. Prioritizing hiring for professional staff would allow us to produce greater results without the stress created by constant staffing shortages. Creating more clinical positions would allow us to provide more mental health and substance abuse services so that our clients' needs are met faster. Expanding our professional staff onboarding program to at least a week would provide new hires with the context to understand how their work fits in with the department's broader goals. Also, front-end assessments of youth clients and their families would allow home supervision staff to offer support as soon as possible, increasing the likelihood of success for our clients. To meet our collective goals for community care, the department must also continue to change internally. The values of dignity, fairness, race and gender, equity, and hope should be at the forefront of everyone's work and present in everyone's workplace. All staff should be trained and developed to embrace these values starting on day one by focusing not just on training, but on long-term development and success. We have the opportunity to change the culture within the department for the better. As we move forward into this new future, there must be true equity among all classifications. SEIU represents administrative support staff, records and booking clerks, clinical staff, accountants, and more. 
it is far too often overlooked that each one of our members plays a vital role in the success of the department and therefore in the success of our long-term community goals. If we can ensure the values that we prioritize for our community are reflected in our workplace, where all staff at all levels know that they have a voice, we will be able to build a unified department where every member is valued and respected. This must be fostered and developed at every level of leadership. Our former chief got us started, but we know that there is more work to do to make it a reality. The department must continue to focus on the well-being and growth of staff under their supervision. Part of that is a real commitment to coaching and guidance when mistakes are made. We need leadership that cares about our well-being and takes the responsibility of staff supervision seriously. Mental health and life skills services should be a priority for both the community as, as the community we serve as well as for our, all of our internal staff. Finally, in order for us to more effectively serve the community, a focus on staff retention is essential. When we're talking about reshaping probation, there is a base of knowledge that has to be reached before we can move forward. Every time someone who has gotten their introductory training on trauma-informed care, de-escalation, or restorative practices leaves, we have to start over with the next person. It must be a priority of the department to keep great talent on staff so we can build meaningful knowledge. Only then will we grow together as a team and for the community. To maintain such talent, we need more room for growth and development within the department to alleviate team member stagnation. Because there are limited promotion opportunities, staff are forced to view their work as a stepping stone to something else. This hinders our ability to make lasting change. By overhauling classifications and creating new steps to grow into or finding clearer paths for promotion within probation, we will see better retention, more job satisfaction, and most importantly, better services and quality of care for our most vulnerable communities. We envision a department that operates with equity at its core, a department where there is trust between staff and management, with honest communication from leadership that demonstrates respect for those they are responsible for. We see a department where each employee understands how their, work, how their work fits into the bigger picture and where there is a real effort from leadership to understand the work being done by those they supervise. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. We hope that you see the necessity of what we have shared here and that the county continues to make this work a priority. By mirroring the values that we are putting forth for our community, we can create a department that is both just and hopeful for staff as well. Thank you. And that concludes the uh, comments from the representatives of the employee associations. We'll now move on to the individual callers. For all those individuals that requested to speak on this item, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We will be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear notification that your call has been unmuted. You will then need to press star six to unmute your phone. Each caller will be asked to state their name for the audio record, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. You'll hear this sound when your time is up, so please conclude your comments at that time. I would remind the public speakers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. Before we identify the first caller, I would like to note for the board that we have 12 individuals that have requested to speak on this item. Erin, if you could please identify the first caller. Yes, thank you. Our first caller is 3187. Three, one, eight, seven. Hello, hello. My name is Armand King, COO, co-founder of Paving Great Future. I actively work with the population that we're talking about. We call them clients. That's young adults and adults. And I, I just heard a bunch of beautiful, beautiful things about the transformation of probation, and I am all for it. Clinton Lacey, I am a community mentor and been a part of community mentor Credible messenger uh, team here in San Diego. Um, I just want all of these ideas to really come to life. You know, last week, you know, I firsthand watched probation um, send a youth to uh, um, recommend it, recommend them to to eight years. A um, 17 year old boy in custody already spent a year. We had mapped out uh, several different community organizations that he would be working with, including mental health, and and uh, come and work with us. We had a job identified with him and a connection, I was going to be his personal mentor, so was able to speak to him in court and really watch the criminal justice system bury this young man. I think this is a great setup and what we're moving towards, but I would like to see this move to actually trickle down from the heads up to the people that are actually um, 
of making these recommendations. We hear a lot of good stuff coming from great speakers and people that put great um, words on paper and present to committees like this, but the actual work is not being trickled down. Um, I would like to see the work continue um, that Chief Little, uh, excuse me, Chief Little John, Assistant Chief Little John and Chief Adolfo Gonzalez set out to do. It is a tragedy that we lost off of Gonzalez, a super tragedy. I would hate to see that this, um, the work that they started off. I know it's, it's like turning a Navy ship in the water. It's not going to be overnight. This criminal justice system was set up this way many, many years ago before my lifetime. And I know it's going to take some time for, we to, for us to get it right. It has never been right. So for us to actually make this a just system, it's going to take some work. So I, um, I'm just putting my bid out there personally uh, for Assistant Chief Little John to step into his, his rightful role as the chief and so we can continue to work and not get somebody else with the mentality of the past probation system. It did not work. It has not worked. And it's not working right now. The DJJ is not an alternative to community-based organizations and the work we're doing. It, it turns our kids into criminals. It sounds sexy, it looks good on paper, but it is one of the worst systems for our kids from the community. YOU and DJ need a full facelift. It is, um, it is not um, making our kids a, a better way, uh, better people and ready to enter into society. It is doing the exact opposite and making them further criminals. It is kindergarten for prison and preparing them to do time. That's all, but uh, yeah, let's continue to do work that I heard about today. I mean, I, I great ideas, but great ideas are nothing without action. And let's make this really, really happen, okay? Let's, uh, probation officers' main jobs should be working themselves out of a job. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 8058. 8058. Yeah, hello, uh, County Board of Supervisors. My name is Khalid Alexander, um, and I'm with Pillars of the Community and a, and a community member that has been very active in working on these types of issues. Um, I just want to address, you know, I think we've made a lot of great uh, changes, and I've appreciated many of the um, presentations, particularly around kind of how youth are treated and both on while being incarcerated and after incarceration. But I also think it's important that all of these conversations are prefaced with the reality that we're willing to spend, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands on individuals and millions of dollars to punish adults um, and to punish youth, uh, but only give them $200 and a pat on the back when they are released. We're doing, you know, surprisingly well when it comes to youth and changing kind of some of the draconian racist practices of the past, but we need to make these same changes for adult programs. Caring about kids and not the adults who are raising them, if we are caring about kids and not the adults who are raising them, we're failing the entire county. We need to make sure <clears throat> that we put our resources towards building human beings and not punishing and harassing people who have served their time. So please continue to support all of these types of changes that are happening and making sure that California and San Diego in particular becomes leaders um, and support the individuals that have served their time, the organizations on the ground that are supporting them, and all of the individuals who actually care about building a healthy and strong community and care less about punishing and directly targeting black and brown uh, community members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is 0916. 0916. Uh, hello, my name is Arthur Soliano, President and CEO of Youth Empowerment. And I just want to speak briefly of the last five years, the support of uh, probation, in particular with uh, Chief Adolfo and uh, the Assistant Chief Ruben Little John. Uh, the support of what it's felt like, what it's looked like with their supportive partners of CCFY, Clinton Lacey out of Washington, D.C., DYRS. I happen to be uh, an adult that went through the system, 23 years of the system. Um, I've been out eight years, put a nonprofit together, and I've, I've seen the fruits of the labor of being at the table, talking to public safety, advocating with the program, with the resilience program, we work with our juvenile population with in partnership with Say San Diego, Project Aware, and then with our adult program through the Board of State Community Corrections, where uh, we put an application 
and our core proposal was on lived experience. So all the everything that's being talked about today with evidence-based practices, CBT, trauma-informed, restorative practices, is, is the work that's happening with boots on the ground. We are having a lot, a lot of high success, especially during COVID-19. It seems like during COVID-19, into this process, everybody went into the silos, right, and just hit out. But the individuals in the community were boots on the ground. Our numbers are still high. We're connecting with the participants. I want to uh, just commend probation and all the partnerships that have stepped into our lives, individuals like uh, Ruben Littlejohn, Chief Adolfo, Jason Drugsman, Carnal Law, the CTC, Community Transition Center, has been an excellent, excellent resource for us, Angela Burrow. But we, we, we need to keep this momentum going and all the relationships that were built in with the community over years of just being at the table, advocating what works, what doesn't, is the process that's been going on for the last four or five years. In particular with uh, uh, the, the leadership that's current with Ruben Littlejohn. So we're advocating for him, I am, because I've seen the fruits of his labor. I've seen him be at the table with the community. So that means a whole lot to us as an organization, as an individual, but most importantly, it means a lot for the community. So when Nathan Fletcher mentioned that, uh, you know, is there any lived experience perspective? Are these individuals gonna be involved? Most definitely, we are already involved. We're already doing the work. And the work that is without funding, we're out here being essential workers on the front line, putting ourselves at risk because this is what we love to do. This is our passion. These are our people. We want to connect with them and bring them all the resources necessary to, that we need to do to help these individuals get back on the right track. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 6418. 6418. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, sorry about that. My name is Mario Antonio Valladolid. I'm a resource counselor for the Santa Unified School District in the Department of Re Restorative Justice Practices. I'm also a San Diego Gang Commissioner for Area One. I'm calling um, because I'm in support of Ruben Ilieva, who's going to be the next Chief of San Diego County Office of Probation. I met uh, Ruben when, uh, in 2007 as a field lieutenant for the San Unified School District and then uh, as, a, as our chief of police in 2012. Um, he, you know, he worked closely with us in our Department of Racing Relations and Advocacy and also district leadership. The, the idea was is to reduce uh, arrest. Uh, he helped us in building relation, better uh, relationships between officers and student relations. Uh, and also he helped create, um, started the conversation for the uniform discipline procedures to be more restorative in nature, which I can gladly say that we were able to pass this past November. But the conversations that were going on back then are what set the, the, the groundwork for what is going on right now in our district to, you know, the, the good work of trying to reduce suspensions, reduce expulsions. And, and Ruben had a lot to do with that. Um, I myself, I can tell you right now that um, I had unfortunately uh, some negative contacts with law enforcement at a very young age, and uh, my lack of trust for law enforcement was huge. Uh, but after working with Ruben and after working with school police through his leadership, I can tell you right now that my whole ideology uh, about law enforcement changed, and I owe a lot to that man. Um, the relationships he's built with community members, with, with activists, with community leaders uh, is golden. And even as uh, when in, 2000, in 2016, when he became the assistant chief of probation, he continued those relationships. And in through those relationships with community leaders, we could uh, continued relationship with our school district and uh, other community organizations like NCRC and others. Um, we were able to reduce the number of youth on probation we lowered the recidivism rate of juveniles on probation, and uh, he aided in the closure of Camp Barrow, which was huge, because that Camp Barrow was a place that even when I was a youngster, it was a place that a lot of my friends went to. So, I mean, you know, 
I say this because the relationships that he has built with, with community, the relationships he's built with our district, which is the second largest district in the state, we serve over 120,000 young people. Unfortunately, uh, the, um, some of those uh, of our students end up on probation, but having uh, someone like Ruben who understands our school district, who understands the policy, the politics, the, the bureaucracy of our school district, and understands law enforcement is able to be that bridge, has been key. It's been something of a powerful uh, partnership that I wanted that, you know, if he's been given the opportunity to be the county officer and the chief, we can continue this this fight. We can continue uh, this message of, of, of you know of being restorative, of of understanding that keeping the high accountability, but yet giving the support that these young people. As many of the speakers said before, um, so I just want to thank you all again for giving me this opportunity, and I hope that you all that the board of supervisors makes the appointment for Ruben Leva as a chief of San Diego County Office Probation. Thank you all and and God bless. Thank you. Our next speaker is 9938. 9938. Hello, this is Tasha Williamson. Um, thank you all for speaking. Thank you for the speakers that spoke. Um, I appreciate knowing uh, what is going on and the transparency and openness. Um, for me, this is all for nothing if youth and adults are still being failed in the education system and court system, which is a pipeline to probation. What I didn't hear is equity for community and community organizations, which have been putting in sweat equity and a lot of free labor. I want to ensure that this board knows that doing business as usual will no longer work. That must, there must be a major shift in reallocation of funds and securing more funds so hundreds of millions of dollars go not to just big organizations like Sandy's or universities, but to small grassroots organizations with lived experience as experts in assisting youth and adults, families, and communities transform their lives and impact a failed justice system. I'd like to lift up a young man stuck in juvenile detention, not because he is guilty of crimes, he is charged of, but because a DA wants to win and someone must pay. A judge refuses to review the court documents and probation department refuses to step in and say something. We see you is not just happening in New York. It is also happening in San Diego County. The adult who attacked him sees no consequences because justice sees a white family and finds sympathy and sees a black youth and sees conviction. Travion Austin is a human being forgotten in a juvenile system which refused his right to go home. This must stop too, because from what I heard today is that Blacks and Latinx still have the highest rate of incarceration, and we all know why that this disparity exists. Oftentimes, we see buzzwords swoop into our systems as if they were just created by white people, the better system. I will continue to talk about transformative justice because your white power structures have failed generations of Latinx, Black, Indigenous, API, and others as you call them, as if they have no direct, if they have no direct ethnicity worthy of being named. I support alternatives to incarceration and believe that probation department must provide equity in the allocation of resources and funding back into the community. This is important. We have given you our free labor for far too long. You must make sure that it is equitable, it is equal, and it is just. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 9858. 9858. Yes, this is Malcolm Mutaki. I'm organizer of Pillars of the Community. I'm a student, a Project Rebound student at San Diego State University. I'm a formerly incarcerated youth, and um, I've been on juvenile probation, and I've also been on adult parole. And from my experience, the only function that probation and parole has ever served for me was extending my incarceration and collecting urine from me. That's it. As a, as a juvenile, I had no access to clothing, housing, job development, nothing. And I work also inside of the juvenile halls with youth that are incarcerated right now with the Movement Enrichment Program. And unfortunately, this is the case now. Most of these young people that get out, they don't know where to locate resources or where to locate the help at. So I'm saying that if we really care about, about justice for these young people, then we need to start by doing away with probation and all together in the first place. Because there's no reason why a youth who serves their sentence, a lot of the times uh, being overly sentenced, like I was 
uh, sentenced to almost a half a year in juvenile hall for testing positive for cannabis, that that these youth should should not have to do their time and come out and still be monitored and treated as second class citizens when they come home. So I know that's a far that's a, a far leap to say that we need to totally do away with probation altogether. I'm not here to support any candidate or any probation uh, officer, but I'm also saying that if probation does exist then the only function that they should serve is not to probe into these youth's lives and to, and to collect urine, but should only exist to, to, to allocate resources to these young people. Because if a young person gets out of juvenile hall and they don't know where to find job development, they don't know where to find clothes, they don't know where to get a bus pass, this is a major problem. This is a major problem. So we need to totally do away with the system or, or, or have them in function to only exist as the allocation of resources. Anything other than that is a, is, a, is a crime against our young people. That's all I have to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next speaker is 2061. 2061. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hi. This is Layla Aziz calling from Pillars of the Community. And... First and foremost, I was very moved by Malcolm, our Muslim organizer's testimony, because he's been through that system. On the other hand, I've been on the other side of the system and for 19 years was an expert in reentry programs. Um, I brought over $7 million of reentry grant money into this program. I'm now with Pillars of the Community and I'm in a great place where we can say, let's look at evidence-based best practices. Let's support the systems that are there and let's not go for the money that we can have someone who's actually in the community that cares about where this money is going and ensures it's going to the right people. When reentry first started, and this is um, back with George W. Bush's prisoner reentry initiatives, we saw a lot of the lack of best practices. We've seen a lot of the programs that have been implemented that are not evidence-based and do more harm than good. And what we do, we need is a robust programming of services for people that are coming out. The adult population is suffering the worst. With AB 109, we thought that those resources would be moved into that population. We have a very vulnerable population in the adult population, which are young people 18 through 24 who have the highest recidivism rate. In that, we also know that their frontal lobes are not developed. We know their decision-making is not there. And we know the types of programming and the successes that they need. It was good to hear a lot of the program um, nonprofits on the phone, the community-based organizations, and speaking for this. We need to be honest with each other about what works and what doesn't work. It has to be rigorous. It has to be validated. And it has to have the fidelity, the fidelity held of those evidence-based best practices. We need to give more money and more resources into our community. I can say that we are in a good situation because our founder and president will not take any of this money because we want to make sure that we're there because we live, work, and play in the same communities that have the highest concentration of probationers and parolees. So this is personal to us. We are part of our community. We don't come into the community and work. We live here. Our kids go to school here. So I want to thank you so much for the work you guys are doing and have a great day. Thank you. Our next speaker is 9792. 9792. 9792, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello? Hello. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sophia Haidari. I'm an organizer with the local nonprofit Youth Will. Reforming our justice system has been a priority for our organization for quite some time. We've been particularly focused on the transitional age youth, um, 18 to 25 year olds. We know that our system at this moment is very binary and disproportionately impacts our black and brown youth within this demographic. And we recognize that our county has made significant strides in reform um, and is moving towards even greater reform. And in moving forward, we would like to see more work prioritizing our K population to help us address equity and lower the recidivism rates for this age group within our county. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 2321. Two, three, two, one. Two, three, two, one. Please press star six to unmute yourself. You are unmuted and you may proceed. Two, 
two, three, two, one, you appear to have remuted yourself. So please press star six and then check to see that your phone is unmuted on your end. Okay. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dana Brown. Thank you to the San Diego County Board of Supervisors and esteemed panelists for this opportunity to highlight the healing centered transformation of our San Diego County Probation Department for juveniles and adults. Thank you too for unanimously approving last month that racism is a public health issue in San Diego County and establishing the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. Expanding on the equity focused practices and evidence-based trauma-informed policies led by former Chief Aldapo Gonzalez and Assistant Chief Ruben Leva the last four years, please know the apparent successor is Ruben Leva. Ruben Leva is instrumental in the Credible Messengers movement in San Diego County, locally called Community Mentors. With Mr. Leva, a tremendously valued leader in the communities throughout our region, his longstanding, highly respected reputation with families and service providers in our communities exemplifies his cultural humility and proven capacity to cultivate relationships. Building trust takes time. Throughout his tenure as the Chief of Police with the San Diego Unified School District and becoming the Assistant Chief of San Diego County Probation, Ruben has consistently engaged with the communities and is a trusted leader within the juvenile justice systems, officers within probation, and families in our neighborhoods throughout San Diego County. As a commissioner on the city of San Diego's Commission on Gang Prevention and Intervention, we learned during the bi-monthly meetings of the dramatic decrease with youth on probation and in custody in juvenile hall. This proven track record epitomizes equity-focused healing-centered systems changes through trauma-informed resilience building practices and policies. In 2019, California's tax dollars invested $12,134 to educate a child and adolescent in public education. In 2019, California's tax dollars invested $81,000 to house an individual in jail or prison. The return on investment with the dramatic reduction of youth on probation or housed in juvenile hall is profound. Ensuring this momentum is not impacted, Ruben Leva will carry this movement forward and build capacity on the last four years of expanding the integration of trauma-informed units for females and males, continuing the staff training on brain science with adolescents and supporting families in need. Bringing in an outside individual would delay this healing center transformation. Given the term limits the Board of Supervisors have, now is the time to build capacity on what is presently in place. All transformation starts with trust. Trust is built through relationships. Please listen to your constituents. Please listen to the community members. Ruben Leva gives us hope. This is public safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we have no additional callers on the line at this time, Chair Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, thank you to, uh, to all of the callers and everyone who participated in this. Uh, let me ask my colleagues if any of them have any uh, comments or thoughts uh, they, they, would, they would like to make here at the conclusion of our conference. Chair Fletcher, um, I mostly wanted to share the process that we agreed to as a board. So let me know when you think it would be appropriate. That'd be great. Sure. Talk about the next uh, chief probation officer. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, that'd be wonderful. Okay, thanks. So first and foremost, thank you uh, to everyone that um, joined us today. I think that um, as a board, we're really looking at the future of the work that we're doing, particularly in probation. This is one of our biggest responsibilities, um, having uh, overseeing the, you know, looking for the next probation um, uh, director here at, uh, at the Board of Supervisors. And so I wanted to say thank you to uh, my colleagues um, and for, um, the opportunity to co-lead with Supervisor uh, Lawson Reamer um, the actual subcommittee process for uh, our next Chief Operational Office Probation Officer, and we're really excited about the search process. Uh, we understand um, that we want to make sure that we're that this is a process that's community based. Uh, that we are doing this work with our justice partners to provide uh, those uh, um, in probation with the necessary resources and support that they may need to be successful. 
So um, I know that uh, we will be sharing the timeline uh, with most folks, but I think most of you know we, we started the process uh, back in January. Uh, the recruitment for the chief probation officer started January 14th. It will close March 7th. Uh, during this time, uh, Supervisor uh, Lawson Remer and myself have worked together and we have sent out invitations to t stakeholders, um, not only to join us today, but also uh, for community members to join us as part of a screening panel. And I'm happy to say the majority of those invited have already, uh, and I'm gonna share what those who those names are just because I think it's important for transparency. Uh, but most of these folks have already confirmed that they are gonna be joining us as part of, of this process. The application process for the human from Human Resources um, will actually close on March 7th. The week of March 15th, Human Resources will send applications and materials to all the qualified applicants, all the qualified applicants, I'm sorry, to the uh, community stakeholder screening panel. We are gonna be doing it on Zoom um, because we wanna make sure that we're COVID safe. Um, but the process will include uh, the following uh, uh, folks. It's uh, Genevieve Jones-Wright, who's the president of the Earl B. Jillian Bar Association. Monique Carter, who's a public defender representative, Ariana Federico Mandrago from Mid City Can, Francisco Medrano on SEIU representative, Sandy uh, McBriar, Children's Institute, Beto Vasquez, UCSD Community Outreach um, and STEM Work, Max Dispositi, uh, North County LGBT Center, uh, Judge Talisha Martin, from, uh, she's a juvenile justice judge, and Mark Tran from the California Endowment, and Shannon Edison from the Probation Department representative. So all of these folks will be meeting together with both uh, uh, Supervisor Lawson and myself. We're gonna be, um, we have a process that's very thorough uh, with questions, et cetera. We're gonna be meeting with the community stakeholders uh, for the screening panel on March 19th uh, to give additional information. And then on the 26th, we will be conducting interviews for the applications with the hope that on April 21st, uh, April 1st, I'm sorry, the, um, the panel will be able to dock it up to three applicants to be interviewed by the full board of supervisors uh, for the April 6th board uh, meeting. The, the process is one that's, you know, we're gonna make sure that it's uh, transparent and thorough um, and that we provide the most qualified candidates uh, to our colleagues. Um, and then they must go before um, confirmation for the superior court judges. So um, if there are any questions, we'll make sure that all of this information is, is made public, as I mentioned, but um, I am happy that I get to work with uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer um, in this process. And I don't know if my uh, colleagues have any questions regarding the process, but um, wanted to make sure that we were clear, as I know there's a lot of questions around that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to just thank, um, thank Supervisor Vargas because she uh, just uh, went through a lot of what I wanted to walk through as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, and more than anything, I just want to express uh, how incredibly informative and helpful this has been. You know, just zooming way back, there's no question that uh, we have a crisis in our criminal justice system. Um, and it's a crisis that's been building and brewing for a really long time. Um, and we have an opportunity here in San Diego to start to address some of the, the, the root causes of that crisis. Um, and I think the, the analysis um, and perspectives we heard today, uh, I, first, I personally found them incredibly helpful and informative of thinking about, you know, how do we look for the best out possible outcomes for our communities as we look at our criminal justice system, um, as well as, you know, how do we take these lessons learned and apply it to thinking specifically about probation um, and about um, you know, the kind of leadership that we'll have going forward in the probation department. And, you know, I, I do believe that we're all on the same page, ultimately, with the same set of goals. You know, we want to protect our communities. We want to keep our communities safe. We want to make sure that folks uh, have the opportunity to have a fresh start, you know, it, when they're released and uh, can get back on their feet um, and have the opportunity to have the resources and the support that they need to, to start anew. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to figuring out how we make that happen um, even uh, even better than we have uh, in the past here in San Diego County. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Anderson. I just wanna thank uh, everybody who put this together. I think it was very informative and I hope it's a, I hope it's a pattern that we use moving forward on other issues as well. Uh, I think so often People come to us and talk to us about our ideas, but we never get to share them. And when these are publicly noticed like this, it gives us a, a chance to share among our, after hearing the great information, 
being able to share our opinions with each other. So uh, Chair Fletcher, I just want to thank you for uh, uh, pushing this forward. And I want to uh, uh, thank the, uh, my other two colleagues for, for putting this forward as well, because I, I, I got a lot out of it today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor uh, Anderson. Um, I, I agree. I mean, so often when we're, when we're doing our meetings, we've got a packed agenda and we got to get through all the things that we've got to get through. And it's, it's kind of a, a rush of doing that and be able to take, you know, just a half a day and convene publicly, uh, hear from experts, hear some presentation, be able to think a little bit more in depth about some of the things that we're doing. Um, I think is a, is a very good thing and, and a way for us to kind of thoughtfully work through and engage in some of these issues. And so I think it's certainly a, a model of, of meeting and discussion and deliberative thought that, that I think I think we should uh, really, um, you know, it, embrace and, and engage the opportunities ahead on, on other, other type issues. Um, because it does give us, as, as we all know, with the Brown Act, we can't assemble together to talk about these things. And so to be able to do that um, and, and along with the public, right? And, and very transparent about information and studies and direction and different types of things, I think has, has been very good. Um, I think so much of what I heard today really reinforces the, the path that we've started down as a county uh, in terms of the, the uh, opportunity for change and, and what we can do um, as it relates to probation, both juvenile and adult. Um, I also think it's really reinforced the need uh, I know I've had the opportunity to tour. I believe Supervisor Vargas has had the opportunity to tour. Uh, I'm not sure if Supervisors Anderson or Lawson Reamer uh, have had an opportunity to go out and physically see uh, the campus that is, that is being constructed in Kearney Mesa. Uh, I had the opportunity to go with some of the members of the community, some who called in today, uh, to really see the, the transformative opportunity and change that's there. And I think expediting uh, that phase two uh, not only can can keep San Diegans to work building some some great infrastructure and projects that that you know we want to get done now, uh, but can also complete that vision and 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 allow us to really do that. Uh, something we didn't have as much time to talk about today uh, is the opportunity on our youth behavioral hub. Uh, that is a project we've been working on for some time with Grady uh, Children's Hospital uh, to co-locate right there on the same uh, footprint where we're putting uh, our campus a a juvenile hub. Uh, dedicated uh, for behavioral health, not, not just for those youth in, in, in the, the probation system, but for our entire county. Um, I think that is an important part. Um, I think looking at the, the legislation that's going forward around the, the length of term of probation and figuring out is there a way uh, that, that we might be able to uh, uh, address that early um, and, uh, and get ahead of what we know is coming and, and really embrace the best practices is, is right there. Uh, along with really continuing to drill down on the disparities. Um, I think as we continue to work through, uh, you know, who gets reoffended, how long do they stay in custody? How are they treated? Breaking that down by race and ethnicity, then we can begin to really tackle issues of those uh, inequities and disproportionality uh, that, is, that is in our system. And so I think that there's a, a lot ahead of us for what we need to do. And then finally, the search for a new chief probation officer. Uh, obviously, we need someone who has probation experience. Uh, I think that that is a, a given uh, and, and someone who is going to bring uh, a fresh perspective and fresh energy to, uh, to what is ahead of us uh, and understand that we got to keep, we got to work closely with our probation officers. Uh, they, they are committed uh, and, and change is hard. Asking anyone to do something fundamentally different than the way they've done is going to be hard. Uh, but they've been there and they're working through each of these steps with us and we need to continue to make sure we support our probation officers uh, in this transformative change with training and staffing and, and all of the things that are needed uh, in order to, uh, to be successful. Uh, we agree safe communities, uh, thriving youth, uh, adults that have a, a pathway back to uh, redemption and restoration uh, is our mission and our goal uh, and I know that, that we can get there. So. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for participating. Incredibly grateful. We had national experts from all over the country. Uh, we had our own folks. We heard from the public. We talked about other counties in California. We looked at juvenile, uh, adult, and uh, and I'm really excited about where we're going and really appreciate everyone's time. So with that, uh, this board conference uh, will stand adjourned and we will see you all next week. Each regular meeting of the board will take place on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021.
up. Continuous movement, adding balance challenge by lifting the knee or lifting the leg out front. You pick what works for you today.